the most hated comedians of all time. I promised you I would do this, and then, uh, because it got requested so much. So then, I looked at it. I made the, the dreadful error of looking at this, and then it was an hour long, and I was like, yeah, we're not doing that this stream. So welcome to this stream, where I actually do keep my promise. The most hated comedians of all time. It's not rare for- Let's jump right into it, baby. Public figures to attract widespread loathing. Sooner- Bro! They all just like me, for real, for real. Widespread loathing? That's my middle name! God damn. Or later, it's bound to happen. But luckily, in most cases, it doesn't take long for people to forget why they hated you in the first place. True. People are just like, I hate that Nux guy. I don't know why, but that dude, pff, what an ass. What a, what a absolute ass that man is. God damn, what a, what an ass. And give you a chance to redeem yourself. But in the case of Amy Schumer. <laughs> I laugh when people make fun of Amy Schumer more than I laugh at her comedy routine. Is that... Is that sad? Is, th is that is that wrong? Is that sad? Am I a bad person? Yes. She will probably always be known as the unfunny female comic that only jokes about sex. Amy Beth Schumer- She doesn't only joke about sex, she also jokes about vaginas. Schumer was born to a Jewish family in New York City. Damn it! Damn it! God damn it! I have never been this disappointed in my entire life! Ah! 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 I'm so disappointed. I'm like actively annoyed right now. My day is worse. No, I didn't know! Hold up, if Amy Schumer gets so much hate, even though she's Jewish, all right, and everyone on the internet's like, oh, you can't make fun of Jews because then they're gonna kill you and you, they control the banks and the media and you're gonna die and and all that, that psycho shit, right? You have Sneeko going, yeah, you can't criticize Jews, that's why they're all evil, right? That That's like the number one anti-Semitic trope. Then explain to me why Amy Schumer get so much shit i'm sorry checkmate anti-semites <laughs> there we go ab schumer single-handedly saving the jewish people let's fucking go oh god every time i hear amy schumer's comedy now i'm gonna be thinking to myself haven't the jews suffered enough <laughs> <laughs> haven't, the, haven't the Jews suffered enough? Why, Amy Schumer? Oh, no! I'm literally losing my shit. I can't believe this. This just ruined my whole day. And according to her, her religious background caused her to be ostracized as a child. Be Dude, I'd ostracize her as a child. Not gonna... <laughs> oh, no. No! What does that even mean, though? Religious background ostracized her as a child. Jew religious Jews are, like, the most inclusive people. I know. Literally. Being nicknamed things such as Amy Jumer. While that's her- Wait. What? She had a wait, wait, wait. I'm just so confused. She had a religious- Hold on, hold on. She had a religious background. And her friends in her religious background called her Amy Jumer? That is- That, first of all, incredibly lazy. Let's be real. All the, the, the Jewish- no, no Jewish guy came up with that. There is no way a Jewish guy came up with Amy Jumer. Certainly had a negative effect on her, as it would any kid. The other parts of her early life were positive. Her father owned a successful baby furniture company, and be she really out here complaining about her background when she had like the a cushy backstory. Aw oh, man, aw oh, man. Because of it, Amy Jumer over here thinks she's so cool. She grew up in a wealthy household. In her memoir book, The Girl. Ah. <laughs> Things I didn't want to see for two hundred. Thank you. Oh, with the lower back tat. We're never gonna finish this video. I'm just saying, this video just started. We're 40 seconds into this video. It's over an hour. We are never finishing this video in our life. Two. Amy describes taking private jets to the Bahamas during her childhood. Oh. She dares complain about her childhood. She dares. She has the chutzpah to talk out of her tuchis, complaining about her childhood. And she takes private jets to the Bahamas. That's just pathetic.
However, this grace period came to- I think it was classmates making fun of her Jewish background. See, I doubt it because she said she came from a very religious household. If she went to a very religious household, she went to Jewish private school. If she went to Jewish private school, her classmates were Jewish. If her classmates were Jewish, they wouldn't call her Amy Joomer. I'm sorry. I'm reading too much into this, but I'm not, I'm not going to let this one just pass by. ...to an end when Amy was nine years old and her father's company went bankrupt. To make matters worse, the bankruptcy of the company was followed by her father being diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. Oh, her right. father's disease compounded their dire financial straits oh, that, and, that's really shit. and they lost everything, even the house they were living in. This series of unfortunate events was punctuated by her parents' divorce. Amy then moved with her mom to Long Island, where she claims, though not explicitly, to have become a kleptomaniac. A what? What? Am I supposed to believe any of this stuff? According to an interview she gave to GQ, from age 14 to 21, she stole an estimated $100,000 worth of stuff, only stopping after she got arrested and charged with grand larceny. Dude, how does anyone feel bad for her for this? Like, is anyone gonna hear this and be like, oh my god, queen, you're so real for that? The answer is no. Despite how catastrophic her personal life had been up until this point, it's around this time she begins showing inclinations toward being a comic. Her reputation as someone dedicated to being an entertainer shows, and that she was voted class clown when she graduated in 1999. Her interest in being a performer of sorts led her to go to college for theater, and in 2000- Dude, being voted the class clown does not mean- does not mean, bro, you can be a comic, okay? Being a class clown does not mean like, bro, she just like me, for real. Ugh. 2003, she got her degree and moved back to New York City to study at the William Esper Studio, while working as a waitress and bartender part-time for a total of two years. This was a sacrifice she was willing to make if it meant she could pursue her dream of being a professional comedian. She began accruing parts and plays and regularly performing as a stand-up right. comedian in Normal. 2004. Normal Just three years comedian. later, in 2007, she appeared on Last Comic Standing, an NBC talent competition for aspiring comedians. While she didn't win, being eliminated in the 11th episode, she Damn, who would have guessed Amy Schumer got eliminated in the 11th episode, bro? She was, I thought she was destined for greatness. There is no shot, bro. There's no way. She was eliminated? They didn't see her potential? They weren't like, damn, her unbridled potential makes us... Uh. She successfully put herself out there as a working comic. At this point, people were already noticing that her routine was unusual. With Amy... Yeah, it was shit. Focusing a lot on the details of her life in between the sheets. When asked about her participation in Last Comic Standing and whether being a female was an advantage or a hindrance when it came to working the crowd, she said, Last Comic was totally fun. I had a great time because there was no pressure on me. I had been doing stand-up for around two years. I wasn't supposed to do well, so every time I advanced, what? it was a happy surprise. I kept it honest on what? the show and it served me well. Sometimes being a female comic gives you an edge, but most of the time it's a pain in the ass and the pussy. Who says I'm dirty? A pain in the ass and a pain in the pussy. Get it? Because I'm a woman. I don't think of myself as a dirty comic, but I do talk about sex, honestly, and I don't think- She doesn't think of herself as a dirty comic. The only part of her act that exists is sex. She only talks about sex, but she doesn't think she's a dirty comic. Get it, guys? She's mentally unstable. I think people are used to a chick talking about her- but hey, you write what you know, right? She also recorded a Live at Gotham episode for the Comedy Central Network, which had been hosted by many established comedians, such as Gabriel Iglesias, Joe Rogan, and Bill Burr. Within a year, she- Joe Rogan's a comedian? I'm sorry. What? <laughs> I am so confused. I am so confused. What? became a recurring guest on a Fox late night program, followed by her co-starring in a reality show. Though not ideal, since her objective was to work for herself as a comedian, this was an astronomical rise, especially for someone who had just started doing comedy four years prior. Soon enough, she got her own special on Comedy Central and began appearing in so many different pieces of media, from comedy shows that, to acting. That's the wild thing. How did she get everywhere? I am so like baffled at how famous she is because you you would think I know that this is like a controversial hot take. You ready for a very controversial Nuxanor take? You'd think that people that get incredibly famous have some sort of talent. And she doesn't. So like wouldn't wouldn't you think that would you agree gender is irrelevant if you're a stand-up comic? Of course gender is irrelevant. You just have to be funny. You just have to make people laugh. Uh I do think um uh, in general, male comics do much better 
Uh, I don't know if that's just the circumstances of their existence or if there is, like, some sort of secret cabal behind all of that, but who knows? Who knows? Uh, I just actually finished the show The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel, which is the story about this Jewish girl who uh, ended up becoming an incredibly lewd comedian, and um, obviously her family was, like, a little surprised about that (laughs) because this takes place in, like, 1960, and... I'll be honest, it was it was fantastic. It was like a fantastic show. Um, that was like a really great, one of the greats. I have not seen a show that good in a long time. Um, and I have to say, the, the ultimate truth is you just got to be funny. And it does talk about like how women do have it hard in an entertainment agency. But dog, you just have to be funny. It's on Prime as to podcast that it's impossible to name all of them here in part people's dislike of her began due to sheer overexposure where in part it was overexposure the other part was she's incredibly unfunny see like that's that's the beauty you see uh in mrs Maisel, she had it difficult because she was a woman especially in the comedy industry especially in the 1960s which was a very different time uh, and she had a really hard time, but she ended up becoming incredibly famous as a comedian, incredibly influential, because she's just hilarious. Um, so, I and I think that does a really good job to portray kind of what it's all about. If you're hilarious, you will succeed. Wherever they looked, Amy Schumer was there. The first people she rubbed wrong were comedy buffs. Who- the second thing she rubbed wrong was every audience. The third thing she rubbed wrong was the dick of every one of her many love partners. Who felt that her comedy was controversial, but in a safe way, by talking about sex explicitly, but from a female perspective. Many thought that if a male comic had an act as straightforwardly sexual as hers, they'd be relegated to doing what's called a blue comedy, meaning comedy yeah. that relies on sexual jokes as its main course. But because she was a woman, Can't can't be blue comedy if you've never can't 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 be stuck doing uh, male uh, adult comedy if if you've never had sex. Got him. I am incredibly based. Oh god, dude, the virgin life. Disclaimer: I'm not a virgin. I know someone called Mudahar out at one point for lying about his virginity, and everyone lost their shit. So just <laughs> I don't really want, I don't want to get into that. <laughs> it's just it's the saddest drama I've ever heard. It was seen as innovative and considered pop comedy. This didn't affect her career though, and after appearing in even more movies and TV shows, she dropped another special, aptly titled Mostly Sex Stuff. After it was positively received, she received the green light from Kyle. Dude, she's just like, bro, I, I don't want to be that guy. You know what? I'll, I'll even use myself as an example to prove to you how not derogatory this is to women who I respect tremendously. Uh, as someone who has nothing but respect for women in general, I'm going to say something incredibly true and cool. Gamers in chat, people of the world, allow me to tell you something incredibly based and true. Her act, her entire act, is just titties on a YouTube thumbnail. Not not her own titties, obviously, but doing like the act that she did. <coughs> pussy, vagina, vagina, pussy. <laughs> vagina, pussy, boobs. <laughs> boobs, vagina, pussy. I'm going to be incredibly canceled. But <laughs> vagina, pussy. <laughs> that, that was like her whole act. That's like the same thing as like putting big boobs on a, on a YouTube thumbnail and people click on it. And then they realize, oh, the content's just kind of mediocre. <laughs> it's like the same exact thing. Damn. She just like me for real. <laughs> Comedy Central to get her own sketch show. Schumer over here, no, no. Which is somewhat of a badge of honor for a comedian. The show Inside Amy Schumer was so successful that it. Inside Amy Schumer, bro. That's just all of her boyfriends. Got a total of five seasons, and, and all despite of everyone else's boyfriends, people speculating otherwise, only stopped being produced because of Amy's decision to focus on touring as a stand-up instead of shooting more episodes. Why is she? Did he just say like it's received well? Every single one of the videos on this list are rated a six. Man has a six on every single one of these videos. It's like, oh man, this video really kicks fucking pockets over here. Oh, what a goddamn brilliant freaking video, kicking absolute bahuka. They're all rated a uh, six. <laughs> Her show also received three primetime Emmys, further solidifying Amy Schumer as a household name in comedy. And in 2015, she was named one of Time Magazine's 100 Most Influential People. That is so sad, bro. Dude, if I had a nickel for every Jewish conspiracy I was thinking of right now. I'm gonna get can- Alright, this is the Jewish disclaimer. You cannot cancel me. 
All right, you cannot cancel me for this. I'm just saying, I'm just saying, if I had a nickel, I'd have a lot of nickels. That same year, her movie Trainwreck was released, which is... <laughs> she named her movie Trainwreck. No, she named her movie Trainwreck. Oh, she named it after her career. Bro, she named a movie after her stand-up routine, bro. Damn. She's so real for that. It's probably her single biggest appearance in conventional media. With a budget of just $35 million and box office sales of $140, it was a financial success and got her plenty of opportunities. This was the peak of her career as a comic and entertainer, having successfully turned her stand-up skills into a full-time media job. However, at the same time, a general political upheaval began, and by her own choices, Amy was roped into it. On one hand, many skits from her show were skyrocketing in popularity and being shared There's online no because they tackled topics such as rape culture, an extremely controversial and debated topic at the time. This landed Amy squarely in the corner of people who aligned with beliefs related to feminism and social justice, which consequently catapulted her work further into the mainstream. On the other hand, this- That's how you do it. You just gotta be controversial. You gotta pick one side of the spectrum and just freaking go hard on that side. And that's it. That's all you gotta do. Bro. Literally. Also attracted a kind of scrutiny. She if Nux had a nickel, he'd be a happy Jew. I'm joking. Please, no ban. <laughs> what? What is my chat becoming? I thought you guys were cool. No, I'm joking. Of course, no ban. That was- that was hilarious. He was severely unready to be met with. Amy had spent most of her career making jokes involving sensitive topics, and now that she seemed happy to take on the role of socially conscious comedian, the chickens came home to roost. She That's it, baby. Because you see, here's the thing. That's so interesting. See, Amy Sh Schumer, I, I literally cannot say her name without wanting to say Amy Schumer now. It's so, it's so bad, but it's wild. Amy Schumer started off, damn, I never, I didn't even actually think of it this way. She was relatively innocuous. People didn't like her because her act was dull or whatever. But ultimately speaking, she was fine, right? She No one actually paid her any mind. No one actually hated her at all. People only started hating her when she actually took the social issues into her own hands. When she decided it was, it was her chance and her ability to talk about all these incredibly serious things, right? Uh, rape culture and and actual politics and stuff. And then at that point, when she starts talking about all the, the wild shit, the extreme shit, then everyone will be like, well, we're gonna hate on her. She was taken. I, it, it, I feel like that fits in so well. No one actually cared that she was saying, yeah, vagina pussy. But then when she's trying to morally grandstand as a, a person that was greater and better than everyone else by jumping to one end of the political pool, then people started really shitting on her. And I think that's uh, that's a very real thing that happens in this industry a lot. ...into task for the innumerable instances of her being racially insensitive in her comedy. And our right? Because here's the thing. If you go... Listen, I, I don't want to I don't want to sound like one of those. If you go woke, you go broke. <laughs> I don't want to go down that that rabbit hole. That's not what I'm, I'm not touching that shit. But the point is. It's so interesting. I'm just like fascinated by all this. If you are going to try and garner an audience and make your voice bigger by tackling social issues like how racism is bad and how being insensitive is bad and offending people is bad and, you know, all that fun stuff, which, again, y you know, it, it's legitimate, uh, sure. But the point is, if you're actually going to start doing all of that, then the second you are insensitive or you say something that offends someone, then you become a target under the spotlight. That's why I'll never, I never preach this stuff, and therefore it doesn't affect me if someone will find some old clip of me saying something not nice, saying the R word, as it were. You know what I'm saying? I'm just saying. It's, it's just a very interesting phenomenon. You can only affect someone if uh, you're, you're more, your actions contradict your virtues. If they don't, you'll find. Not the hard R, goddamn article released by The that. Guardian at the time reads as follows. For such a keen observer of social norms and an effective satirist of the ways gender is complicated by them, Schumer has a shockingly large blind spot around race. Her lackluster stint hosting the MTV Movie Awards, a rare misstep, featured lazy jokes about Latina women being crazy, while a much lauded what? sketch from the show featured an ad for a training center where old people learn to not be racist. Schumer's stand-up repeatedly delves into racial territory tactlessly and with no apparent larger points. Her stand-up special features jokes Jokes like nothing works 100% of the time except Mexicans and much. Oh, goddamn! 
You see, if you have a joke like that in your history, if you have a joke like that in your repertoire, dog, you do not start preaching shit. Oh my god. Much of her character's dumb sleep persona is predicated on the fact that the men she sleeps with are people of color. I used to date Latino guys. Oh my god. I can make, I can so make fun of Mexicans because I sleep with Mexicans and therefore making fun of Mexicans is totally legitimate now. She says in an older stand-up routine, now I prefer consensual. In response, now I prefer consensual? Oh my god, dude. Where's the joke? Is the joke? Haha, -ha, he's a rapist, lol. Is that the joke? Is the joke, lamau, he's raping me. <laughs> Oh, Lamau. Ah, oh, rape. <laughs> I can't even say it. I can't even say it sounding even slightly legitimate. It's, it's like... It, I... Amy made a series of now deleted tweets stating, I'm a comic. I'm so glad more people are laughing at me and with me all of a sudden. I will joke about things you like and I will joke about things you aren't comfortable with. And that's okay. Stick with me and trust I'm joking. I go in and out of playing an irreverent idiot. That includes making dumb jokes involving race. I enjoy playing the girl who time to time says the dumbest thing possible. And playing with race is a thing we're not supposed to do, which is what makes it so fun for comics. You can call it a blind spot for racism or lazy, but you're wrong. It is a- Amy. Schumer, girl boss extraordinaire, vagina haver and vagina enjoyer. Let me tell you something. You are Jewish, and therefore, you have infinite race jokes at your disposal. <laughs> you literally can make infinite race jokes. Why are you only making fun of Mexicans? That just sounds so wrong. It's a joke, and it is funny. I know that because people laugh at it. Honestly, it's kind of surprising to see Amy Schumer, of all people, express this stance on the issue, but then again, I'm sure that after this brush with backlash, she cut back on making these kinds of jokes. Lol. I wonder if this is still her opinion on it nowadays. In Definitely any case, not. Soon She's taken the, the hard approach the other, the other way. Now it's nothing's okay. After she was once again making headlines, this time for posing nude for a photo shoot. This decision, paired with her previous controversies, led many people to see her as someone who was willing to do anything for attention. And Dog, the Jews have suffered enough. We did not need Amy Schumer on, on, on our back. But we, the Jews have suffered enough! <laughs> and even some of her previous fans began seeing a disconnect between who she used to be and who she became. It's also worth noting there was a time in which doing a nude photo shoot was still a frowned upon thing to do, whereas now, it's becoming weird if a female personality doesn't have an OnlyFans. Okay, alright, that's putting it the other way. I don't think it's weird if a female personality doesn't have an OnlyFans, alright? Come on, bruh. Come on, bro. Come 2016, and you things gotta, continue you to heat up. You don't gotta do women like that, dog. God damn. As Amy was accused of stealing jokes from multiple comedians. <gasps> this is my favorite Amy Schumer drama. Okay, until here, all that was, like, mostly stuff I didn't know. I, all I knew was she wasn't funny and she stole jokes. This is gonna be my favorite segment. I'm ready. I'm ready. Let's go, baby. Many of whom were working alongside her during her formative years. The Ellen DeGeneres clip. Listen, I don't like Ellen DeGeneres. Ellen DeGeneres, more like Ellen DeGenerate. Ah! Yeah, I don't like her. However, the clip where she steals Ellen's joke in front of her is the funniest thing in the world. It, it, it literally the funniest thing ever. As a comic, giving further credence to the allegations. How's this? Oh, that's perfect. They can ring you up right over there. Thanks so much. Okay, I'm Bengi. If you need any other sizes, you please let me know, all right? Okay. Hi, how you doing? Great. All right, did somebody help you with this? Uh, yeah, she's right over... Oh, she's not there. Did someone help you today? Yeah, um... Oh, oh that's my okay. God. What did she look like? Oh, my God. She stole a whole skit? Uh, man. She's... <laughs> uh, dark hair. Do you know what he looks like? Yeah, he is wearing, like, a, like a vest. Oh. If she had a favorite president, it would probably be Lincoln. Are there any other distinguishing uh. features? I would guess he probably voted for o Obama. While certain comedians regret it. Uh, that is, like, dude, she just steals the jokes and make them worse. There's no way she act. she just steals jokes. She steals full skits. And she just makes them worse. 
<laughs> oh, it's so sad! ...having suggested that Amy was a joke thief or even outright defended her, the damage was done, as no matter what she or anybody else said in her defense, the audiences who had seen the alleged instances of joke theft for themselves oh, were yeah. convinced that she had stolen the jokes and nothing could change their mind. Hold on, if you don't show the Ellen DeGeneres uh, joke thief, I, I'm actually going to show that one uh, separately because that is probably the best... That is the best joke stealing I've ever seen in my life. To this day, when people talk about her, that's the main thing she's remembered for. Yeah. Though her reputation with the- Ah! This is the other- de Ellen DeGeneres, Amy Schumer! Dude, this clip is so funny, please show the clip! Public was already in the toilet by 2016 due to this controversy. The political climate of the time and the- So funny. She went out, she, she, uh, she did nude photographs, and then she was- talking about her background and she was incredibly lewd and she got incredibly divisive and political and honestly no one cared no one even for a moment cared it's only once she started actually stealing people's jokes that is when people started calling you a hack and that is when people started disliking her you cannot say er er they hate me because i'm a woman if they didn't have any problem with you until you were literally stealing other people's jokes in your same field like like, dog, come on. Bats about SJWs that permeated every facet of the culture certainly didn't help her get back on her feet. There's no better way. God, I wish Evan was here. He would have heard feet completely unwarranted and for free. He would have lost his mind. I'm just saying. To put it, then to note that ever since they acted in the TV show Girls together in 2014, Amy Schumer had grown increasingly closer to Lena Dunham as the two evolved towards the same direction. That direction consists. Yo, Ella Chizui, thank you so much for the gifted sub. I appreciate the support. Consisting mostly of being body positive narcissists and conflating being disliked for your actions with sexism. Ever since Lena interviewed Amy in late That's 2016, the they've remained a steadfast duo, which isn't surprising considering that from that point onwards, they had the same target audience internet bound busybody women. The thing Amy didn't think through with this rebrand was the fact that she was a comedian, and the only comedy her new target audience consumed was through clips online, if any. True! She's trying to be a stand up comedian in a world of tick. TikTok. Damn! Meanwhile, the people that are into comedy enough that they're willing to pay for tickets to go to a show tend to be a lot more on the politically incorrect side of things. This jarring combination resulted in many clashes between Amy and her audience, such as when 200 fans walk- Dog, Sneeko's girlfriend is getting drilled so hard right above me right now. God damn. I don't know if the, the sound actually gets into the stream, but lord, Sneeko's girlfriend is- Screaming like Amy Schumer does on a bad day. Fucked out during one of her shows for bringing her routine to a screeching halt to bring a Trump supporter up on screeching like Sneeko's girlfriend is right above me right now on stage to demonstrate how stupid he was. Only <laughs> what? In a live show, she brought up a Trump guy to, to prove how stupid he was. There's no way she could be that dumb. How is she so disassociated from reality? And then she claims people don't like her because she's female. Maybe it's because you're an idiot. Only to pivot to calling Trump himself an orange sexual assaulting fake college starting monster. Listen, if you want to insult Trump, honestly, sure. I think everyone is allowed to be insulted. I believe in a, in a beautiful world where you could make fun of everyone. But this is the laziest shit I have ever heard. You, you call yourself a comedian, and you're going to say, well, Trump is a orange sexual assault fake college starting monster. Bro, I'm not even saying you're wrong <laughs> about any of it. <laughs> like, yeah, sure. But you're a comedian. You're not supposed to regurgitate the same shit that everyone's been saying, right? Like, that's literally your job is to make up jokes. Oh, wait. It's not and kick his supporter off stage. The mean spirit- She called up the supporter to debate him. She called Trump a fake college starting sexual assaulting monster. <laughs> then she kicked the guy off stage. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. Heritedness that was once present in her comedy didn't actually go away. It just morphed into a high strung, politicized version of itself that defensively called out other people for things she felt guilty about. For example, in January yeah. 2016, a 17 year old film critic called Jackson Murphy posted a picture with her captioned, Spent the night with Amy Schumer. Certainly not the first guy to write that. Damn! <laughs> killed her. Just actually killed her. Thanks for the anonymous gifted sub. She replied passive-aggressively saying, I get it, because I'm a whore. Glad I took a photo with you. True.
She gets it, because she's a whore. Listen, nothing personal, kid. Hi to your dad. While journalists ran with it, praising her retort as some grandiose moment of standing up to slut shaming, this was grating since just a couple of years prior, Amy would not only call herself, but other women, whores jokingly, and that was just the tip of the iceberg since she had told jokes exponentially more offensive than what Murphy had said. One particular example of this that got her in trouble with other comedy fans was when, during a Comedy Central roast on Charlie Sheen, in which she was participating, she decided to tell a joke about Steve-O, who was in the audience. And Steve-O is here. Steve Steve-O, great try. Steve-O! What? But I truly am, no joke, sorry for the loss of your friend Ryan Dunn. I know you must have been- What? Could have been me, and I know we were all thinking, why wasn't it? <laughs> um. Not only did- She did not. There's no way a human being can do that. She did not, bro. That is a whole other level of just fucked up, brother. Sorry for the loss of your good friend. <laughs> My God. My whole ass did a spit take on that one. Yeah, I just stole that from chat. That was a great line. Did her joke immediately make the room plummet? I felt like pulling an Amy Schumer there and stealing that joke from chat. I felt like it would be very, uh, very on point for this episode. When she mentioned Ryan Dunn, Steve-O's friend who had tragically passed away a couple of years prior, the punchline was just saying, A couple of years prior! She had to dig deep in her asshole to come up with that shit. Oh my god. Everyone wished Steve-O had died instead. Well, this is... We all totally wished it was you instead. Ha, <laughs> Lamau! Lamau! Lol. Limfow, brother. <laughs> Got him. Lol, 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 Damn, I'm so sorry your friend died. Anyway, wish it was you. <laughs> oh. Par for the course when it comes to roasts, and the rest of the audience still reacted somewhat positively well, to her. Of course they reacted to po positively. They're in a freaking show. They don't, they don't think she's going to say something that, like, ludicrously, bafflingly horrible without, you know, being prepped to do it or something. I don't know. That's that's crazy. Joke. Steve-O was visibly bothered by it, which upset many of the people who only saw it after the fact. Yeah! Given how beloved Jackass and Steve-O in particular are by the public, this felt gratuitous, like Amy was trying too hard to be edgy, contributing further to her being generally disliked. Steve-O eventually yeah. spoke out about it, saying that despite being pissed off about what she said at the time, he talked to Amy about it and they came to terms. Regardless, Very nice of the fellow. Let's freaking go. The fact that he didn't personally hold a grudge against her did very little in the way of salvaging her botched roast. Yeah, that is so true. It's like uh, a lot of people say, but she apologized and her apology was accepted. I mean, true, but that doesn't make her any less of an asshole for doing it in the first place. Like, yes, you're right. Apologizing is the absolute bare minimum of what you can do after you've done something like that. But sorry, bro. In That's the same year, enough. she released her memoirs, which was noticeably an attempt by Amy to improve her PR, explicitly writing herself as an extremely likable every woman who any- Dude, everyone that releases their memoirs, it's like, dog, how much do you want to suck your own dick that you're going to write a whole book about your memoirs? Holy crap. At least pay someone else to do it for you so that you can make believe it's- it's not completely narcissistic. Any girl could identify with, despite being a multi-millionaire movie star, infamous for her off-color remarks and insensitive sense of humor. <laughs> Literally anyone could be just like me. They can also sleep with every guy in the city. They can also have their daddy's private jets fly them to private islands when they're kids. Anyone could be just like me. Just believe in yourself, girls. Even the fact that she was already writing an autobiographical book, despite being just- She was writing an autobiography and she released a memoir about herself? There's no way this could be a human. There's no way this is human. Who writes a memoir about their self while working on an autobiography? I'm sorry. I'm sorry I'm pausing the video so much to add so much commentary. I'm sorry I'm not doing the React streamer meta where I'm just going to take a shit while this man is talking. Just 35 years old was seen as a symptom of her narcissism. The nail in the coffin for many was her 2017 Netflix special called The Leather Special. I think that's when I actually first heard of her. That's when I started myself diving down the 
Amy Jumer rabbit hole. Which became widely hailed as one of the worst specials ever, and for some reason, the quintessential demonstration of the unfunny female comedian archetype. The response was so bad that some theorized it was the reason Netflix suspended the rating system they had in place at the time, yeah, but that didn't that. stop people from expressing themselves about it, since YouTube was littered with videos compiling the worst moments of Schumer's comedy. In the face of this, she, along with journalists, of course, blamed it on none other than the alt-right. SEXISM! Right. After abandoning- oh, the alt-right. True, true, true. The alt-right like PewDiePie. The persona she yes. had been building for years of a comedian to whom edginess came second nature, she completely embraced her new identity as a feminist icon, mostly because it was expedient to do so at the she, she just like me, for real. The two of us, us feminist icons, just getting together, putting our cheeks on each other's faces, and s drinking the blood of our enemy- I don't know what I'm saying. Time, ...and because the media was already setting her up to play that role, even before she actively tried to play it. In February 2018, just a few months off the peak of hashtag MeToo, which started in October 2017 due to the allegations about Harvey Weinstein, another comedian, Aziz Ansari, was- Wait, Harvey Weinstein was a comedian? Oof. Oh, oof. Oof. <laughs> Put on the spot for an allegation of sexual assault. Instead of it being instantly integrated into the movement, this particular accusation became a controversy of its own. Not only did Aziz respond by disputing the woman's claims about the nature of their encounter, but many felt that her own story corroborated what he said, since it included some instances of consensual sexual interaction. Oh, damn. Oh, oh, damn. ...and a retelling of the following morning, wherein the woman told Aziz she felt he violated her boundaries and he apologized. This, when added to some journalistic mishandling on the end of the person who initially reported the story, and... Much to the surprise of everyone alive. ...the fact that it was much more of a gray area than Weinstein's allegations, culminated in Aziz's accusations becoming a controversy of their own, with some even saying that it was effectively derailing the Me Too movement altogether. Just a couple of weeks after the eruption of this news, Amy decided to chime in and claim that what Aziz Amy decided to chime in. What is she? Is she Keemstar? Whenever I hear like some comedian uh, or some like famous celebrity, whatever, actually feel the need to chime in on 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 something, I'm like, bro, bro thinks he's Keemstar. <laughs> oh God. Thank you, Valo, for the sub. I appreciate the support. ...did was not acceptable, before recounting her own story. She claimed that when she was a teenager, she was flat out raped. While she was initially appreciated for trying to give a voice to victims of sexual assault, upon further examination, even people who hadn't sided with Aziz felt that Amy was adding to the confusion. She said, My first sexual experience- She made it about herself. She took something so horrible that happened to someone else, and just made it about herself. There's no way. There's no way. This was not a good one. I didn't think about it until I started reading my journal again. When it happened, I wrote about it almost like a throwaway. It was like, and then I looked down and realized he was inside of me. He was saying, I'm- <laughs> Sorry. Can't. I'm so sorry, and I can't believe I did this. In her interview with Oprah, she specifies that she was asleep when this happened. Now, of course, this is extremely terrible. That's horrible if that happened, but... I've never found myself in a position like that. But I'm not a woman, so then again, can you even take anything I... Do, can I actually have feedback on this? Probably not. Probably not. Terrible and definitely qualifies as S.A. The problem spurs from the facts that her situation is seriously different from what Aziz and his potential victim were discussing. Additionally, despite her liberal usage of the word rape while talking about the topic, she simultaneously implied that these gray area rapes, as she puts it, aren't necessarily criminal, just unacceptable behavior. Gray area rapes, which aren't criminal, but they're acceptable, is one of the wildest lines I've ever heard in my life. Sorry, I'm just just putting it out there. I've never heard the term not illegal, yet unacceptable, gray area rape. 
My vocabulary is expanding. Xavier, which further muddied the waters. After she joined the discussion, her older re jokes resurfaced and were used against her. However, they of all course. paled in comparison to an appearance she made on the Opie and Anthony show, wherein she tells a story about being in the front seat with a cab driver and not only sexually harassing him, but outright placing his hand on her crotch without what? any lead up to give him a chance to offer anything resembling consent. As uh, that sounds like a pretty gray area rape if you ask me. Listen, not that I'm allowed to have an opinion, but that sounds like a pretty gray area rape rape. As you can expect, people came to her defense saying that if he allowed it to happen and went on with it, that was him consenting. However, if that's the case, then the same can be said for many other of the gray area situations Amy claimed constituted. Dude, I cannot, I cannot take anything she says seriously. I feel like she just grinds on the meat of every single possible news thing in the world that she could just shove in her mouth and, and try to gargle some clout out of it. She wishes she was Keemstar. <laughs> did wrongdoing. What's worse is that this isn't the only time Amy had unceremoniously admitted to having committed some kind of sexual assault. In her memoir, she tells a story about a guy named Matt where she says, It was 8 a.m. My dorm room phone rang. Amy, what's up? It's Matt. Come over. Knock, knock. Ring, ring. Where is he? Finally, the door opens. Oh, it's God. Matt, but not really. He's there, but uh, not really there. His what? face is kind of distorted, and his eyes seem like he can't focus on me. What? He's actually trying to see me from the side like a shark. Hey, he yells too loud and gives me a hug too hard. He this sounds like a fanfic. Like, this actually doesn't sound real at all. This sounds like a fanfic. It's written like a fanfic. It's like a bad twit longer. He's f***ing wasted. But I was here and I wanted to be held in touch and felt desired. Despite everything, I wanted to be with him. And then came the sex, and I used that word very loosely. His penis what? was soft. It felt like one of those de-stress things that slips from your hand. He what, what is even going on? Like, I, 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 I don't even understand, like anything anymore i'm just lost this is minecraft erotica levels of writing bro if chat gbt existed back then i would be like yo can you write a harry potter fanfic except from the perspective of me he started to go down on me. That's ambitious, I think. Is it still considered getting head if the guy falls asleep every three seconds and moves his tongue like an elderly person eating their last oatmeal this is the worst thing I've ever seen. Yeah. The only wetness between my legs is from his drool because he's. What is this trying to prove? This is the worst thing I've ever heard. It's your own fault. This is all her own fault. No, am I mistaken? She doesn't have to sit through that. Now sleeping and snoring into me. Again, despite it being debatable to what extent this actually occurred, it certainly yeah. looked awful for Amy, who was trying to be an advocate on the topic of gray area rape when she sounded a lot. She's an. She's an advocate, guys. Like a gray area just herself. Not only did she speak about this openly without an ounce of self-awareness about how terrible it sounded, she immediately followed it up with a series of complaints to herself about how great of a friend and comedian she was, as well as a complaint. <sighs> Complaints about how devastating comments about her weight are. The cherry on top is that she didn't just write this into her memoirs, she also performed it as an acceptance speech to an award. And the video what? for it has millions of views. You really cannot make this up. It's tough enough to be a comedian that pushes the envelope while defending talking points that very much preclude things like offensive humor, but I imagine it must be even harder to be as rigorous as she is on sexual ethics when she's had at least two close calls, if we can even call them that, with being the perpetrator of SA. But because of the impenetrable shield the industry and the media put around her that deflected any genuine criticism from the Amy Doomer at it again. Let's go. Let's go. <laughs> Public, she eventually found some success in her rebrand as a politically correct, sex positive figure. And oh no! This is not the way I wanted this story to end! She found success doing this? Aw, oh, man. In 2019, she put out another comedy special called Growing. Though it didn't get ravingly positive reviews, it was leagues ahead of the reception that the leather special got. But perhaps this was because the parts of her audience that had any expectations or standards for what she was putting out were long gone by the time it came out. While she retains the forced Facebook feminism that became a part of her personality in 2016, the premise- Forced? How dare you? Forced. You claim her feminism is forced when she is a woman with a vagina? Damn. That's 
That's wrong, bro. The purpose of the special is decidedly less stupid, or at least internally consistent with the politics she punctuates it with, mostly focusing on her personal life, her marriage, and her pregnancy. When she noticed that this more candid approach to doing comedy was well appreciated by consumers, she leaned into it. A year later, she dropped a docuseries through HBO Max about the difficulties she had with pregnancy due to her career as a touring comedian, as well as her health issues such as endometriosis, which ultimately culminated in the surgical That's removal rough. of her uterus in 2021. Oh, Fortunately for her, the reception was even more positive than her special, and it was crucial in reigniting her presence in the mainstream media, which- Oh good, we were able to find a way to reignite her presence in the mainstream media. I was really worried that she'd fall off. Damn, that would have ruined my whole day. Became much more- The real tree man, thank you for the two gifted subs, I really appreciate the support, it is immensely appreciated because I am watching eye bleach right now. I am watching the equivalent of eye bleach, and I am lo loving it more scant after her run-ins with journalists and comedians alike. It's unlikely she'll ever successfully reverse the damage she did to her public perception, since the people who see her as an industry plant, annoying feminist, unfunny hack, or all of the above haven't found any reason to change their minds about her. Regardless, for me still, the biggest plot twist ever is that she's Jewish. I can't believe it. I can't believe it. I can't believe it! Ah. Uh... What are we gonna do? What are we gonna do, guys? What are we gonna do? What are we gonna do? God damn. Despite all the hate, she can't breed huge W. That's not the takeaway here, chat. She's accrued over the years. It doesn't look like she'll be going away anytime soon, as she continues yeah. to take every opportunity to make current events about herself, and article writers Literally, continue to indulge oh her. What Dude, I have to start doing that. Every time someone gets into drama, I have to just be like, bro, this reminds me of the time that I was, uh, I was mugged in a highway in, uh, in New York, in the Bronx. It was terrible, and it was dark, and, 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 and a large black man. And just really make it incredibly racist, but then no one could cancel me because because I, I'm just... Yes, yes. This is the huge plan. This is the plan. I, I can't see it possibly going wrong. A recent example of this comes from last year when Will Smith... Yo! I knew he was going to talk about this also. This, after Amy Schumer, this was probably the second uh, the second thing that came to my mind. After Chris Rock at the Oscars, yeah. Amy, who was hosting the night along with, we're still in Amy. Oh my God! Her downfall is literally longer than than, than freaking the Araboros, bro. She has the longest downfall. It's slowly but surely dying. Oh my god, she just cannot stay down. This is like as long as those YouTube history of, of Keemstar and Chris Chan. Bro, Chris Chan documentary's gotta take a page out of Amy Schumer's book on how to continually fail so much that there's so much content that could be made. Oh my god, it's still going! Wanda Sykes and Regina Hall took to Instagram to say that she was, and I quote, triggered and traumatized. Right. Again, it seems like she selects the kind of language she thinks is more likely to get a reaction from people. And in too. That's why I, I, I always make it the, the most possible thing. That's why it's rough. She, she figured out how to make... Dude, she'd be such a good YouTuber. Like, she just needs to make the best YouTube. She and Trisha Paytas should combine forces. If they combine forces, they would be unstoppable. Another show of hers, she also commented on the slap, saying it was an example of toxic masculinity. Dog. Shut up. Why Why do you feel the right to have a comment on everything? Who are you, man? What's interesting is that on the same Oscars night, she was planning to joke about Alec Baldwin having accidentally murdered someone while filming a movie, as well as... She was going to joke about Alec Baldwin accidentally murdering somebody, but but that guy, but freaking Chris, whatever his name is, went is out of hand. Dog, are you even a real person? was James Franco's oh essay God. allegations, but was advised against it. As I previously said, she never stopped being tone deaf and insensitive. She just strategically pointed it away from topics that could get her into real trouble while pivoting to socially conscious talking points. There's no telling if the never ending spring of second chances for Amy will ever dry up, but given how many scandals she's made it through that would probably ravage almost anybody else's career, something tells me her token feminist comedian immunity is still very much in effect. Damn. At her peak of unlikability in 2016 to 2017, she was being considered for the lead role of the Barbie movie. There's no way that she was being considered for the lead role of the Barbie movie. I, I, I'm stopping. I'm going to call that Cap. I am going to call that. I'm, I'm calling Cap. There is no shot. There's no world that she was get, even considered. You saw articles about that? There's no way. There is no way. There is not a, not a chance. Zero shot. 
I'm not even willing to entertain that this was a possibility. I heard she was. There's no shot. V, which you've probably seen ads for recently as it stars Margot Robbie and Ryan Gosling. The only reason she isn't in the final product was that she chose to drop out due to the fact- My asshole she chose to drop out. Act that the script didn't have a feminist edge. Barbie didn't have a feminist edge? What are you talking about, woman? What? How is she a real person? There is no way she's a real human. Oh my God, dude. I'm like, actually, I feel like I'm overdosing on something. I feel like I, I, my brain rot is getting too bad. Barbie doesn't have enough of a feminist edge, guys. Holy crap. Now that she has a successful TV show on Hulu with Life and Beth, it wouldn't surprise me if she scored some A-lister parts in movies in the near future. If they can keep... Oh, man, she's just never going away. Keep Ezra Miller on Hollywood life support, despite the fact that he's a walking PR nightmare. Amy Schumer is no trouble at all. I believe the saying goes, a jack of all trades is a master of none, but oftentimes better than a master of one. In the case of Brendan Schaub, however, some have cast doubt on this adage. Born and raised in Colorado, Brendan's family had a history in competitive sports, with his father being a second degree black belt in Taekwondo. I'm actually overdosing on cringe right now. I've never, ever, like my heart is pounding. Oh, and his uncle, Pax Beal, being a bodybuilder and ex-football player. There's no coincidence, since genetics definitely played a role in the proclivity towards athleticism. Schaub grew to be well over six feet tall and unsurprisingly quickly found success in pursuits such as football and lacrosse while in high school, lettering twice in the former and four times in the latter, even being voted MVP in his senior year. While he didn't attract the attention of any talent scouts when he tried out for the football and lacrosse teams of Whittier College, he got accepted into both. Though he was majoring right. in sociology, it was just a placeholder degree while he focused on his prospects as a full-time football player. Finally off Amy Schumer. It, it only took me about a minute talking about this dude for me to realize, but I am like... I am sweating, I am crying, I am sad. Once he was done with college, he ultimately never got drafted or signed, causing him to retire in 07. However, this didn't mean he'd given up on being an athlete, far from it. After abandoning football, he picked up martial arts, in particular, boxing right. and Brazilian jiu-jitsu. Much okay, like his previous right. forays into sports, he quickly got somewhere with it, winning the novice division heavyweight title in Colorado and becoming the training partner of Shane Carwin, a heavyweight contender in the Very UFC. Cool. With this connection, he transitioned seamlessly into being an MMA fighter. Once again, he started out extremely well with four wins in a row, all in the first round. It was only after three exhibition matches in the Ultimate Fighter, which he won, that he experienced his first loss, followed by another four victories in a row, Man, one of them against pass. Marco Crow Cop, one of the most respected fighters in the UFC, though already 36 years old by that point. Not only could he beat Goku though? That's the question, because if he can't beat Goku, is it even worth listening about this guy? Only did Shab win, but his win was ruled the knockout of the night. After this, however, his fighting career gradually slowed down until it halted completely in 2014 after his loss to Travis Brown by TKO. Initially, he planned to continue fighting indefinitely, but after his loss, Joe Rogan and Brian Callen essentially did an intervention live on a podcast to convince him to retire from MMA. While their conversation was long, a slightly edited version uploaded to YouTube netted over 5 million views. That's People great. were mostly taken aback by how brutally honest Joe was to Brendan. While Brendan took his UFC losses in perhaps more stride than he should have, no knockout was as devastating as having his two best friends walk him down conversationally and strip him of his ego in regard to the reality of the situation. In the bluntest terms possible, while still being sympathetic to him, Joe explained that Shaw was simply in way over his head when it came to fighting, and if he kept putting himself in the cage with elite fighters, he would continue to get knocked out and hurt until he suffered irreversible brain damage. Honestly, that's a true friend a true friend is someone that'll hurt your feelings even though because they care about you honestly i respect that so much that's that's the way to go baby yeah, that's what you gotta do. Ultimately, it seems that Shab recognized that Joe was right, and that being a professional fighter was far too big a risk for a guy like him, who certainly had other ways of making money besides getting his head kicked in by people who were more proficient than him at MMA. Despite it obviously not being ideal that a conversation as sensitive as this was taking place in front of millions of people, both parties Yeah, that, that's, that's always the question. Even if your advice is good and your, your heart's in the right place, dog, why are you doing it on an interview, though? Like, uh, this is obviously a very important conversation, and it's very personal, and, and you're, you're turning it into content? 
God damn, that YouTube grind set don't stop. Showed the kind of respect and grace that is becoming increasingly hard to come by these days. Eventually, years later, the two revisited the intervention, and when asked about why he brought it up in the middle of a podcast, Joe said that he wasn't planning to do it, but once the topic came up, he got genuinely emotional and I did it out that. of a deep sense of concern for Shab. Due that. to the nature of the situation, there was no way for Brandon to come out looking good. If he had gotten angry, he would have just been seen as delusional. But because he ended up agreeing with Joe, it just fanned the flames of a perception people already had of him. Him, which was that he was Joe's yes man and went along with anything he said. Then again, people often that say that That sucks. That sucks when you can't escape from that mindset where no matter what you do, the world will always will always look down at you, will always think that you, you're the pussy. Damn, that's rough. Joe was a yes man that changes his opinions based on the guests, so at this point, this didn't get Shab too much hate. If you exclusively take into account his career in fighting and his participation in podcasts, the most Shab could be considered is annoying or not the best communicator. However, things changed drastically when he made a hard pivot to being a comedian. That's it, baby. You start off... Oh, see, the thing, it's so funny how many comedians' careers are kickstarted uh, by the fact that they were famous in some other area and they can't continue in that other area. So they'll try comedy. Have you noticed that that's, that kickstarts so many comedians' careers? I wonder how many comedians actually become famous through being funny instead of through being unable to continue in some other capacity. Damn, that's wild. Starters, this move was considered poorly thought out. Since it's like people that become YouTubers after being interviewed on Dr. Phil. It's like so many people are just like, well, Dr. Phil made fun of me in front of millions of people. So I'm going to take my borderline psychosis to the masses and... So Brendan spent the majority of his life being yeah. an athlete in some capacity and had absolutely no experience or seemingly prior interest in being a comic. People were confused as to why he didn't become a coach or open up a gym, especially considering that Eddie Bravo, another frequent JRE guest, took that route with significant success. Johnny a Bravo. year prior to his departure from the Octagon, Schaub had begun a podcast with fellow Joe Rogan collaborator Brian Callen called The Fighter and the Kid. Eventually, either because the podcast was good enough or because Schaub and Callen were sufficiently connected, the podcast was was picked up by Fox. Most likely, it's a combination of the two, since at the time, plenty of episodes were getting hundreds of thousands to even millions of views on YouTube. All right, all Many right. episodes featured comedians and other more established personalities, which certainly helped it become popular. Dude, it's just, it's a, it's a roller coaster. If you're popular, it's so much easier. Everyone thinks comedy is easy? I don't know. Do you think everyone thinks comedy is easy? I just think uh, people feel like if you, you're in a room with a bunch of your fans, whatever you say could make them laugh. Like, I know that uh, when I did panels and conventions before I c got too scared <laughs> of the psychos in my audience, <laughs> not at all, don't worry, guys, that was a joke, that was a total joke, I promise, I was just joking, <gasps> for sure. But uh, uh, when I used to do that stuff, and, like, you had this massive room of your audience, you could say anything, and people were just so excited to be there, they would laugh. Like, uh, I gave a, an audi a panel in front of a full room, uh, it was... Dude, I don't remember. It was hundreds of people. It was a full room. And I would say, like, Sakura fans? There are no Sakura fans. Like, the place would just erupt in laughter. And I'd be like, dude, that was not that funny. <laughs> they were just excited that they saw it in person. Um, yeah. So I feel like uh, it becomes a lot easier when you have a lot of yes men. So if you're already funny, then... Um, if you're already funny and if you already have an audience... I feel like you feel like you could just keep rolling with that energy. In retrospect, the way Brendan came off in the show was much less obnoxious than what he'd become infamous for. Not only could you sympathize with him, but you could also occasionally laugh at his exchanges with Brian. This was very impressive since this was someone who wasn't media trained, with no experience in the field he was getting into. And with a speech impediment, who was somehow doing well Damn. for himself in a medium that consisted entirely of being good at communication. He must have been doing something right. At least that's what people thought at the time. The problem was Brendan's relative success in this area started getting to his head very fast. Uh -oh. While he's never been the... Oh, that's rough, buddy. I I'm just finally realizing, wait a second. This Brendan guy doesn't seem so bad. But then I'm like, wait a second. Why is he in a video that's titled The Most Hated Comedians of All Time? Oh, I see where this is going. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. 
Oh, I see where this is going. The most charismatic guy. Earlier on, he was likable, as the podcast relied mostly on the chemistry between him and Callan, whose conversations often sounded like two friends talking. But That's as the, the show best. grew, so did Brendan Schaub's ego. Title, the title's not clickbait after all. To astronomical proportions. Oh, no. Brendan is notorious for being someone who's easily suggestible, and in an interview he and Brian gave to the Dallas Observer, he reveals that Brian was the one that told him to start doing stand-up. He says, We're having success with a podcast, and Brian right, said, right. Hey man, we should do the show on the road and do a live show. I thought that, oh. that sounded terrible. But his idea was not to take the podcast on the road. Is he, but throwing, is he throwing his boy under the bus? Damn, that's never a good look. But to do a live comedy performance, he wanted me to open up and do stand-up. I said, that's not my wheelhouse, I know my limitations. But he said I was looking at it wrong. He wanted me to start off by telling us. <laughs> this dude really saying, like, dude, what's the sauce of that hentai asking for a friend? Man literally is saying that right now. Maybe not literally, but he is figuratively saying that right now. He's like, listen, I'm not saying that I, uh, that I am um, funny and I, I'm not trying to say that I'm actually funny or anything, but he said I was funny. He put me in front of all these people. I'm just saying, I'm just saying. <laughs> Story, and we added from there. For a guy who's competed his entire life in athletics, competed at the highest level in football and fighting, fought in front of 60,000 people and millions of people on pay-per-view, nothing beats these live shows. Man really had to put in all those numbers. Man really had to list everything he's ever done. Man really had to go out there and talk about all the famous things he's done in his life. It's like, Nux, do you want to be sponsored by Raycon Earbuds? Well, I would want to be sponsored by Raycon Earbuds as the guy with 2 million subscribers on one channel and almost 700,000 subscribers on another channel. Dog, it's not easy being this guy with 400,000 followers on Twitter and like 300,000 followers on Twitch. Uh, it's kind of wild being that. Okay, I'll do it. <laughs> Can you imagine if Brendan listened to his gut instinct here and didn't get into stand-up? Yeah. Within a year of this terrible lapse in judgment, Brendan had evidently the developed- the video, baby! The title's not clickbait, this guy's gonna be horrible, isn't he? Delusions of grandeur about his talent as a communicator and performer. Instead of crediting the somewhat sudden success of the podcast and their subsequent live shows to the setup being good and the guest- There's no way he says, well, it's, I'm just that fucking funny. As being interesting, he thought he was the reason they were working. Uh. Oh, no. In 2016, he started doing some stand-up shows as a solo act and started his own podcast, Big Brown Breakdown, a name he wisely changed to The Shab Show. His podcast was well-received, at least initially, because for once, he was talking about something he at least had some experience with, all right, all right. fighting. Okay. Over time, however, the show's ratings took a downturn as listeners noticed that the show was gradually moving away from being about fighting and towards being about Shab. One of the reviews on iTunes puts it pretty succinctly. I used to love this show. Shab is trying to be a Hollywood star or something, and it's changed a lot over the years. Dude, we don't care about name dropping or anything celebrity like. We listen to your show because you are funny and down to earth. Get back. My audience just wanted anime videos and I'm talking about YouTuber drama. What's going on? He's just like me for real. Back to basics. No, 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 no. That was a joke. That was a joke. I still make anime videos. It's actually pretty tragic to look at how raving the reviews for the shop show used to be and how much this unchecked ego destroyed his reputation with people who genuinely liked him. This issue wasn't exclusive to his podcast, much to the contrary. It polluted every facet of his public life. In The Fighter and the Kid, his tendency to recklessly interrupt guests and even his co-host Brian became increasingly prominent. Oh my god, he just like me for real. As early as the show. I have to stop making these jokes. People are going to believe me. Joe's departure from its affiliation with Fox in 2016, people were picking up on their deteriorating relationship, oh. as Shab would often ridicule Brian's opinions and frequently Ooh, cut him off. That's, despite that's ugly, bro. That is ugly. The fact that, even though we didn't have any of Brennan's hands-on experience with mixed martial arts, Brian frankly sounded more knowledgeable on it. Overall, Brennan just seemed like he was no longer trying to be likable whatsoever. In another venture- I don't know if he was trying to be unlikable. I think that was more of a side effect. No one tries to be unlikable. It's like, dude, I was trying so hard to be unlikable, and I was successful. <sighs> yes, Grant. <laughs> I was so successful at being unlikable! <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I just like making fun of people so much. It's so fun.
of his, the Below the Belt series, which is simultaneously titled Food Truck Diaries and Fight Talk, because Brendan can't seem to settle on a name if his life depended on it, Brendan would frequently screw up the names of the fighters he was talking about. This was jarring, since part of the appeal of the show, which was greenlit by the TV network Showtime, was having someone with a background in the UFC talk no about way. fighting. But and the man didn't even get names right? Dog. Nux is a react dandy now? Well, on the second channel, at least. Throughout the entire thing, he consistently sounds like he has no idea what he's talking about. Regardless, because of the sheer caliber of the people Shab managed to get on the show, many of the episodes were very successful on YouTube. As people had come to expect at this point, every time Brennan was successful with an endeavor, it just magnified all of his character flaws. Another of his behavior patterns that had become noticeable was his tendency to brag about his lifestyle and accomplishments, often resorting to exaggerating and lying about them to make himself look good. While he had already been doing this for yeah, a long well, time, that and seems to be the meta with every comedian ever. Initially, no one had any reason to suspect it, but as the public's opinion of him grew negative, people started to scrutinize his claims, only to find out he was basically a pathological liar. One of the best examples- Just like every comedian ever, <laughs> and every YouTuber, I don't know a single YouTuber that's not a pathological liar. Come on, bro! You're titling videos here at all times. You, you need your video to be clickable in front of every human being on the planet. Dog, we're all pathological liars. Let's be real here. Let's be any any YouTuber that tells you I am not a liar, dog, stay away from them, brother. <laughs> stay away. Run. Do not ever trust a YouTuber. Chat. Of this is his. Especially if they say that you could trust them. This is not happening. That's why I say don't trust me. Do not trust me. I I, I cannot be trusted. I can I can literally be lying to you for my own benefit a hundred percent of the time. You should not trust me. Anyway, leave a like and subscribe, because I'm the most real guy you'll ever meet. That's right. Editor, put put shades on me and the thug life weed smoking thing in my mouth. Yeah! Thank you, editor. Opening performance in 2019, where he goes over his career in the UFC. At the point this video came out, the fighter and the kids subreddit had already turned against Shab and became exclusively dedicated to hate following and- Oh, that's rough, buddy. That's rough, buddy. Documenting his continuous downfall. Identifying as homeless cats and fry cooks at P.F. Chang's what? after a bizarre rant from Shab about why he didn't care about what his haters thought, the members of the subreddit were rigorous in not letting Brendan get away with anything. As a result, the details of his story about his career in the UFC were closely examined, and it turns out he lied through the whole thing. He wow. claimed his childhood dream was to be a mixed martial artist when in a podcast appearance, he claimed it was to play in the NFL. Dude, my childhood dream was to be a hentai protagonist. I always wanted to be the main character in my very own hentai. So true. He played up both his and his opponent's rank in the UFC, as well as lying about how many people were in attendance to make his fight sound more important. He name drops multiple big celebrities, saying they were at the fight, which literally none of them were. These are- My childhood dream was to run an incredibly illustrious and famous crypto scam. My childhood dream was to always, to be the guy that started Crypto Zoo. That was my childhood dream. Just a few of the lies in his individual video, because if you were to exhaustively go through the stuff he says in the podcast, he lies so often about topics so inane that it's impossible to document all of it. Sure, his My childhood dream was to lie so often people believed everything I said would be a lie, so therefore I wouldn't be called out for lying. My childhood dream was to be the guy that could always say whatever I wanted, and even knowing it's an incredible lie, but since everyone knows I'm a pathological liar, they'll just know that I'm lying and I won't get shit for it. That was always my dream. This is not happening appearance is a stand-up comedy routine and comedians lie all the time to make their stories funnier. But True. the issue here is the like fictional me. parts don't contribute to the- Like me when I say I'm not a virgin. <laughs> comedy, they just contribute to Shab's inflated perception of himself. And since we're on the topic of his comedy, his arrogance is also the culprit for the utter annihilation of any respectable career in stand-up he could have potentially had. Instead of putting the work in for a decade or even longer to scrape together one hour of material worthy of turning into a special- There's no way! He had a decade-long career that he couldn't turn into a one-hour comedy special? Oh, brother, this guy sucks! After just a measly couple of years calling himself a comedian, he released You'd Be Surprised. It would go on to become the worst rated special of all time. Damn. Literally. It's a 1.5. Damn! Honestly, that's impressive. Like, 
That's just fucking cool. Like, bro, to get the number one worst video of all time? That's just fucking awesome, bro. Dog, that's that's impressive. My childhood dream was to be known as the world's absolute worst at something. That was always my childhood dream. As a kid, I said to my dad, Dad, you always praise me and give me so much emotional support that hasn't at all fueled my crippling depression. Uh, I wanted to thank you, but also I want to be known as the guy that is absolutely the worst in the world at something. And then I set out to be the worst VTuber and failed miserably. Turns out I'm the best VTuber. <laughs> I've out of 10 on IMDb. While the public was blessed. Holy crap! Dude, Sneeko's girlfriend upstairs going crazy right now. Dog, do you hear this shit? They, they just drilling her at all times of the night. Bro! Can you hear that? Do you hear that, chat? Massive vibrator? Dude, Sneeko, Sneeko likes watching his girlfriend masturbate. I don't think he's ever touched her, to be honest. This isn't bullying. This is, uh... Okay, this is bullying. <laughs> but I mean it in a good way. <laughs> Sneeko's girlfriend, lol. I was fully ignorant of just how incompetent a comic Brendan Schaub actually was until after the special came out. Some of his friends saw this coming from a mile away. Joey Damn, Diaz, no for way. example, despite holding out hope that Schaub would eventually develop into a legitimate comedian, instinct- God, that's so rough. That is so rough. Actually, didn't like Brendan Schaub's move into comedy for the exact reasons that were mentioned earlier. He compared it to the opposite situation. If a lifelong comic who happened to win a couple of amateur fights proceeded to call himself a professional fighter and put himself in the ring in front of thousands of people, you mean like Logan Paul? He he, he means like Logan Paul, right? The guy that that's absolutely terrible at, at fighting and lost. Has he won a single professional fight? Hold on, am I just noticing this right now? No way. Dog, there's no way. There's no way. Logan Paul's 0-1 and 2. He's never won a fight. Oh, man. That is rough, buddy. Well, anyway. It's only reasonable to expect that this person gets the beatdown of their life with a side of thorough humiliation. In a way, <laughs> that's what Brendan got. What meant Who made this video? I recognize this thumbnail. I recognize this thumbnail. Nani? Brendan Shop. Who made that video? Shit. Can't find it. Hold on. Brendan Shop, you'd be surprised. I am surprised. This one. No, I don't know this person. Maybe I've just, I don't know. I don't know. Many people have pointed out was that it wasn't just a regular failure to launch. It was a sign that Brendan didn't care about being a good comedian in the first place. All he wanted was a special with his name on it and he was willing to go to whatever lengths necessary to get something out and earn that validation. But when this like me, for real. special was released and the negative reactions began flooding in, he couldn't accept the fact that he was getting panned. After all, he was a self-professed renaissance man who could instantly excel at anything he tried. Instead of retreating and realizing that he had gotten way ahead of himself by releasing a special with just a few years of experience under his belt as a mature person would do, he decided to falsely copyright strike any YouTube video that dared to disturb his debut as a professional comedian. Ah, ladies and gentlemen, the famous oopsie, I am a fucking loser, so I'm gonna copyright strike all of my critics. Uh, meta. Damn, he really delved right into being a shitty guy on the internet. 
If only someone had informed him of the Streisand effect before he made this dumb attempt at silencing his critics, he could have saved himself from the following years of continued criticism. Love. One particular YouTuber by the name of Beige Frequency made a video called Brendan Schaub's You'd Be Surprised is the worst comedy special I've ever seen, Love. which as you can imagine isn't exactly kind to Schaub's magnum opus. Yeah. Within 24 hours, the video was taken down twice by Joe Rogan's media company, Bent Pixels. What? Which Joe Rogan's company? Oh man. Beige revealed in another upload. For a moment there, Brendan had the opportunity to play the part of a meathead with a bad first special, which would not only be redeemable, but if he handled it right, could be a great place to start out as an underdog. I, I mean, about, I don't know about great place, but yeah. Louis C.K. came back from being exposed for being a pervert with a leaked set that instantly became massive. But Brendan made the fatal mistake of adding insult to injury and letting everyone know that he wasn't willing to take the L. He wasn't just a bad comedian anymore, he was a bad person. And sooner or later, everyone. He's this guy! This is how I heard of him! Dude, I was just, like, losing my mind. I could not figure out where I heard of Brendan Schaub. I've never watched any of his stuff. I've never seen, like, I, I could not... He's a void... He's a moist victim. Obviously, this is where I found him. Horrible comedian sues YouTuber over a joke. That is where I heard of him. There we go. There we go. Noxie La Hyena, thank you so much for the Tier 3 sub one would know about it. The thing about the internet is that events like this don't happen in a vacuum. Once things start moving in a certain direction, the tendency is to snowball, not slow down. Oh, yeah. I know looking up people's net worth online is a meme, but considering the type of gigs he gets and the lifestyle he lives, Brendan is most likely sitting on at least a mill or two. My point being he absolutely does not need to be concerned about what YouTubers are saying about him. By engaging with them and stooping as low as false copyright- Really bro? All you need is a mill or two and you don't have to worry about getting cancelled? Who gave- no one gave me that memo. Wait, if you have a mill or two, you don't have to worry about YouTubers canceling you? What? No one told me this. Damn, that would have changed my whole life. Right, striking people for being mean to him, he was inviting the attention of people to whom stooping low becomes second nature. Because the takedowns were done manually, the people criticizing Shab not only knew that he was looking himself up to see what everyone was saying about him, but he was really upset about it too. <laughs> Perhaps because of the steep decline in chemistry between him and Brian Callen, Brendan sensed that the fighter and the kid had his days of success counted and decided to start yet another podcast, this time with Chris D'Elia, Eric Griffin, and Theo Vaughn, which was initially Initially called the King and the Sting, then the King and the Sting and Wing, and finally oh the Golden God. Hour, bro, because everything. Bro, you have got to stop, man. You you cannot keep changing the names of your shit. Holy crap, dog, man was just. That is a rookie mistake. Changing the name of your podcast three times when you start your pod. Come up with the name of your goddamn podcast before you launch. What? Why? It's not that hard, dude. Our podcast is called the Some Ordinary Podcast, and it's doing fine, bro. Things Shab does is contractually obliged to be poorly executed and require changes on the fly. While he made a wise decision in not putting all of his eggs in the same basket as Callan, since in 2020, Callan was accused of sexual misconduct by four women. Oh my god, it literally doesn't stop. It literally doesn't end. This is the, the everlasting nightfall. Dude, I cannot believe the downfall of people in the public scene people are like bro i am famous nothing could get me now how wrong you are child how wrong you are you pathetic worm Brendan wasn't wise enough to foresee Chris D'Elia also being the subject of scrutiny in regards to his oh alleged God. sexual harassment of minors. Man, what the hell is it about being a stand-up comedian that makes you a freak? Eventually I don't know bro same thing that makes you a freak by being a youtuber I see a lot of overlap. Lee Theo Vaughn was smart enough to notice that his participation in the podcast was more about having his name attached to the project than it being a platform for him to be creative, and he left it. In 2021, Brendan launched his Thick Boy brand and YouTube channel, which amounts to a little- He launched his Thick Boy brand? Man was like, dude, this, this is, I am coming back. I am com- the Thick Boy brand. This, this is gonna go far more than paying a team to make him look like an established celebrity YouTuber, only for the channel to eventually devolve into a platform for all of Shab's already existent projects. This is pathetic. This is just pathetic. Oh my god. I have never seen a man fall- This man fell off as hard as Quibble Cop! Bro! This is really sad.
Additionally, this channel, along with many other channels Brandon has control over, is known for deleting and censoring comments, particularly the ones that get traction. Despite this attempt at yet another pivot that's, to that's being a, a surprise, even a little, <laughs> I feel like that's makes a lot of sense. <laughs> That's exactly what I would expect him to do. Solo online personality, Brennan Schaub's success was entirely contingent on the people he somehow convinced to work with him. While the fighter and the kid's That's popularity so had dwindled, the golden hour was still enjoying growth. But, like all things Schaub, it was immediately tainted by his inability to handle a spotlight. A couple of years prior, in 2019, Brendan and Theo, when they were the only members of the podcast, ran Dude's whole podcast began... <laughs> You know, I think for his next podcast, he should call it Fortnite so that he could appeal to the kids that don't know about his past assholery and also because all of his podcasts are just a battle royale, watching people fall off the podcast, everyone gets nuked. Oh, that one's a sexual assaulter. Oop, this guy's a rapist. Oop, that guy said naughty stuff in the past and had to be kicked. Oop, this guy got into beef with Brendan Schaub and had to leave. It's just a battle royale. Who will be the last man standing on the Fortnite podcast? Dude, lol, bro, I'm telling you, Brandon Shot, reach out to me. Reach out to me, Brendan. I got you. I know exactly how to get you back on top, King. We're answering questions sent in by listeners, and one of them was about if it was possible to be attractive while bald. Using about 5% of his magnanimous intellect, no Brendan way. takes this as an opportunity to say that his longtime friend and spiritual stepfather, There's Joe no Rogan, no. was, and I quote, slinging dick. That expression means- Let's go. Let's fucking go. What a, la what a lad. What, what a lad. What, what a fucking lad. Damn, what a, what a dude means one thing and one thing only, and given the context of the conversation, there was no way Shab meant something else with it. The problem is, Joe Rogan has a wife, which meant Brendan was essentially revealing Joe was cheating on her. This man is just, he's an avalanche of L's! He is an avalanche of L's, bro! Oh, no. Wait, is there a problem with my stream? Why? Okay, listen, try refreshing the page if there's a problem with the stream. Everyone's saying it's fine except for literally one guy in chat. Sorry, bro. Or at least claiming he was. Later on, when the topic got brought up, he tried to claim that what he meant was that Joe was killing it in life. And you can- Yeah, when I said that he was slinging dick, I didn't actually mean he was sleeping with people. <laughs> no way, that's too funny. Wait a second, guy asks him- Hey, bro, can bald people be attractive? And he's like, dude, of course bald people can be attractive because Joe Rogan is slinging dick. All of a sudden, they're like, what do you mean he's slinging dick? He has a wife. Is he cheating on his wife? Uh, when I said slinging dick, I meant he was a successful guy. Yeah, this ain't gonna hold up in court. Guess how well that excuse worked. Yeah. That attempt at a save was so bad that, oh. even though it had already been clipped, they actually cut that part out of the original episode. Dude, <laughs> that's so good. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, wait a second, hold up. My man tried to save, he said something bad that incriminated his friend, and he tried to save it. But the save was such a huge L on his part, they cut it out. They'd rather him just stay on record as the guy that threw his friend under the bus than the guy that tried to cover it up in such a bad way. Oh man. Which only served to make things look even worse. The topic of infidelity Double kill. He eventually came back with a vengeance, but directed at none other than Shaw. Oh my god, the hickey challenge and panty auction. Who is watching this shit? Like, who is actually watching this? Like, I, I sometimes wonder who would be a fan of me. Who would be a fan of these guys? Like, Nanny? Job himself. At the beginning of 2022, on the 49th episode of the Trash Tuesday podcast, fellow comedian Andy Letterman began talking about a certain other comedian, whom she claimed sucked at comedy, who despite having a wife and kids, decided to suggestively invite her to walk him to his truck, oh. an offer Annie rejected. As soon as the story oh. was told, another of the show's- oh, 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 that's, that's not, that's not chill, bro. That's, whew. Host, Kalila Kuhn, immediately deduced who Annie was- That is not a cool name talking about i'm not gonna repeat her name i'm gonna get canceled just by saying her name and said that he had also tried to get with her eventually they said that his initials were bs which pretty much confirmed they were talking about brendan this became a big controversy when the always vigilant fighter in the kids subreddit capitalized on it immediately Dude, this, 
<laughs> if you're when your own subreddit turns against you, oh my god. Picking it up and running, as well as turning it into a meme and making a variety of songs revolving around the phrase, walg me to my trug. While the topic wasn't broached right. in his appearances to Joe Rogan or the Impulsive Podcast, when Schaub went on Andrew Schultz's Flagrant 2, he got grilled on it in a pretty masterful way. Despite asking Brendan about one of the most damning and revealing things possible, Andrew remained aloof as if it wasn't some potentially life-destroying piece of information for when you invite someone to your podcast and they think you're friends, th this is so real, bro. This is so real. It's like, hey, I've been a fan for a long time. You want to come on your podcast? And then you ask questions. And since you think they're a fan, you don't think they're actually going to destroy your lives. But it turns out everyone is a dick-sucking, heart-wrenching bastard on the internet trying to squeeze every ounce of shit out of your scrotum. My God, bro. Oh my god. For Shab. Meanwhile, Shab handled it like you would expect. Stuttering while trying to explain himself like a kid that got caught pissing in the sink, which- Oh, that sounded a little personal there, Tom. I'm not gonna lie. Which, if you don't know, is also an actual real habit of Brendan Shab. Dude, Turkey Tom, you went really deep. <laughs> It's like, next turkey Tom clip. And for those of you that are unaware, this man was almost as cringe as an e-girl that was grinding while playing Overwatch. And uh, for those of you that are unaware, I got tur I got Brandon Schaub's Pornhub history, and it's right there, right at the top of the list. Dude, man is one step away from his Joker arc. And the entire Turkey Tom team. Underlining the situation was other corroborating factors unearthed by the subreddit, such as a video of Brendan Schaub passing a note to a woman, which was presumed to be his number. This clip was- Ah, oh, man, it's so cringe. It's impressive. It's impressive how cringe a man can be. I am not as cringe as this man, and I thrive on being cringe. This is- this is something- this is hardcore cringe. God damn. Oh, Lord was used in a video by a small YouTuber called Uniqueness, and not only were his videos about Brendan Schaub taken down with more false copyright claims, but Brendan actually went the distance and sued him. When trying to defend this Bruh. insane and narcissistic decision, Brendan said, If you want to criticize my fight picks, my stand-up, my podcast, that's what I'm a public figure for. I signed up for that. That stuff does not bother me. Okay, but when okay. you start- Clearly not true because he took down, uh, he copyright strike people that made fun of him, but okay. For slandering my name, stealing content, and creating this false narrative of cheating on my wife and do all this crazy sh and defamatory stuff and using my content and the clickbait stuff like that for yeah, years, yeah, yeah, yeah. well then you're not playing the same game, man. Then I have to do something. If you made your entire career off defamation, I have to do something. Several times I've had my team reach out yeah. and go, we don't want to pursue this, just stop. And he wouldn't. So what do you do? So this narrative and that, oh, this bigger YouTuber suing this other YouTuber for no reason to silence him. You know, I thought you didn't get down with- Bro started calling himself a YouTuber. That's rough. That's rough. Everyone in this- in this fight world, this comedian world, hates being called a YouTuber. Damn, that's rough, buddy. Stooping down to our level, are we? Cancel culture. I don't in any facet. This is different. It's different insofar as it affects him personally. The allegations that Shab was a serial cheater were further substantiated by a series of screenshots from multiple different women, all shown oh, being contacted man. or knowing someone who Shab contacted, some of them oh, even fresh out of high- Man! Ah, oh, you look so dumb right now, brother. Oh my god, dude. He sued a guy for defamatory claims that he was a cheater. And then he's like, yeah, no, you are a cheater. We, we all have proof. All of us, coincidentally, at the same time, have proof that you're a cheater. So. High school. I think for something to be considered defamation, it would have to be false information. So I'm pretty oh. sure that Unique was in the clear there. To help pay for the legal costs of dealing with Shab, Unique God. opened a GoFundMe page. Despite it failing- Dude, you are living up to that Gohan profile picture so much right now. <laughs> to raise the amount of money set as the goal, Brendan lost the lawsuit anyway, along with a whopping- Oh man! Dude got gadunked on $500,000. He also appears to have threatened to serve the Trash Tuesday crew with a lawsuit for daring to tell an anecdote of a guy cheating on his wife, which everyone immediately recognized must have been him without them even having to say his name. He tried to, oh my god, they were like, there's this comedian that cheated on his wife and he sues them. That is the wildest red flag I've ever seen. It's like, try to, uh, confirming... <laughs> 
There's this YouTuber that tried cheating on his wife. Wait a second. I'm getting sued by by freaking <laughs> blank by this guy. Damn, that's rough, buddy. <laughs> Isn't that like that? That is literally tantamount to admitting it, right? Like, if you're going to sue someone for saying, I know a comedian that cheated on his wife, isn't that basically saying that you cheated on your wife? <laughs> Did someone say cheating? I'm going to sue that guy. Through a series of increasingly convoluted right. and schizophrenic Benadryl hallucinations, some courtesy of Brian Callen, no less, Brendan's beef with Trash Tuesday turned into Brendan being absolutely convinced that Kalila and Bobby Lee, her boyfriend, were running the Fighter and the Kids subreddit. In May 2022... <laughs> Wait, this random person that I don't like must be fueling the subreddit that spends their entire day trying to destroy me. Of course, it all makes sense. To Brendan and Brian called Kalila and Bobby to berate them for being responsible for all of the hate Brendan gets online because there's no way right. he could have attracted all of that hate himself, right? right? They must right, 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 right. Just being an overall douchebag and dick and guy that's betraying your audience, that's not going to get you hate. It's it's only <laughs> It's only this one person that actually doesn't like me in real life that, that must be orchestrating everything. He must have, like, hundreds of thousands of fake accounts. The 2.7 million views on the video talking about my downfall? Now, those 2.7 million bots were made by this one person that doesn't like me. It's been a conspiracy. Yes. During this call, Brendan claims to have 300 pages of evidence. Paranoid schizophrenia is a powerful drug. Oh, God, you did not have to do him like that. Evidence that Bobby and Kalila were behind it all. Just two weeks later, he appeared on the Tiger Belly podcast, which ran for an hour and 20 minutes, mostly consisting of Kalila and Brendan going back and forth unproductively, while Bobby just appeared to be shocked to be in this situation. In the episode of... Tra Dude's just like, why am I here? Why am I talking to this guy? Man's clinically insane. Crash Tuesday that came out to address this drama, Kalila specified that the only evidence ever provided to her and Bobby by Shab was a zoomed in screenshot of HTML code that had the Tiger Belly email randomly put in the middle of the code. Now I wish I could explain to you what that means or why that convinced Brendan, but for once, there's no plausible explanation as to what happened. I don't fucking know. It could have been that Brendan was looking for a justification to attack Kalila. <laughs> Man just got so lost. He's like, listen, I have no idea how this is supposed to be a defense, but at this point, we're just gonna go with it. I love for exposing him on Trash Tuesday since he couldn't just do it straightforwardly as it would have been an implied admission of the Trug Wog incident. It could have ah, also yes. been that he Trug wanted to go with the subreddit and needed a pretext besides that the posts on it were hurting his fee-fees. In either case, though, would he be downright stupid enough to just put their emails into the... Yes. Yes, he would subreddit's inspect element, screenshot it, and save that as evidence. As we've come to learn, Brendan is a moron, but is he that much of a mouth breather? If he is that stupid, would he know how to do inspect element? Did he get help from someone? <laughs> there are a lot of unanswerable questions here. Unanswerable questions. <laughs> like, man is mentally deranged. <laughs> would he know how to do something this dumb? The bottom line was that when he became the target of substantiated accusations of wrongdoing, Brendan decided to make a bunch of unsubstantiated accusations about someone else. It really didn't help it that it was Bobby Lee, who was a comedian, and is- Why would they do Bobby Lee like that? Isn't he a nice dude? Wasn't he- isn't he just like a nice fella? He's also well liked by other comedians with a loyal following. Meaning Brendan wasn't just making himself look dumb to random strangers, he was burning bridges in the business that he supposedly cared about. One of the more impactful signs that Brendan's credit with the comedy world was drying up fast was that it seemed that Joe Rogan was becoming more comfortable with putting him in a negative light. Ooh. Dude, how, how could you fail this hard? How can, how can you actually fail so- so hard though? Like... Like, damn, brother. How do you fail this badly? Well, I'm just... I'm just... Not to be mean. <laughs> not trying to be mean! But how do you... How do you fail so badly? Uh... During a discussion on his podcast, the topic of Brendan Schaub's conspiracy theory about the UFC purposely having one of their fighters not make weight so that they could change the card was brought up. And what? Joe said that it was ridiculous and evidence that Schaub needed a handler to keep him from saying absurd things. A pretty common Rogan W. In response, Schaub essentially went, no you, while visibly so upset he was almost crying. I don't <laughs> 
love watching the big male posturing dude cry. It just makes me happy. Listen, it's not because I'm not a bad guy. I swear. It just makes me happy watching the big, big men. Ooga booga. Ooga ooga chaga ooga chaga. Big strong man. Watching them cry makes me happy. Not to be mean, bro, but L. I don't need a handler. These guys need a handler. All this controversy. Damn, that's damn good. Come back. Let's go. Come back of the year. She is underlined by Shab's second comedy special, The Gringo Poppy, which somehow managed to outdo his. The Gringo Poppy. Man called his comedy spe special The Gringo Poppy. Dude, just should just leave the internet at this point. You are a walking, a walking humiliation. You are a walking L, brother. Man's the only guy I know that can L plus ratio himself, dude. <laughs> this is just so sad. Oh, man. His predecessor and underperform even further, getting a mesmerizing 1.1 rating on IMDb. My, if, if I, I wish I was him. I wish I was him and I could have an L this big. Damn. Much like his previous special, the poor reception was quickly followed by a string of false copyright takedowns. Not only- <laughs> This is the guy that says, you can criticize me all you want. Sure. There were many comedians turning on him, but the MMA world was beginning to turn its back on Brendan as well. Ariel Finally, took them enough time. El Helwani and Dana White, just to name a couple, had already noticed how Shab's relationship with fighters and MMA culture was parasitic. With his career in comedy crashing and burning and his reputation becoming disfigured beyond the hope of repair, he couldn't even sell tickets anymore and consequently his streams of income were shutting down because of this brendan ended up firing mark harley from his crew and harley promptly exposed oh man getting fired from brendan schaub's crew that's rough that that's that's a that's a that's a tough pill to swallow damn from the illustrious Brendan Shaw. Brendan for a myriad of things in a Reddit AMA. Among the many things he addressed- I'm not even gonna make fun of Turkey Tom for mispronouncing the word myriad. Like, dude, at this point, Brendan Shaw has taken all the fire. In the post, Mark claimed that Shaw was indeed a pathological liar who chronically overplayed the size of his social media presence, going as far as viewbotting a special on YouTube to the tune of hundreds of thousands, as well- He view botted his videos. You know those measly, those measly 20,000 view videos he had on his channel? He also view botted them. The only thing bigger than this guy's ego is the amount of L's that he takes on a daily basis. As well as buying followers on Twitter and Instagram, Mark also gave significant backing to Shab's cheating. Since he was the person responsible for managing Shab's socials, he got annoyed at how often Shab basically asked him if there were any baddies hitting him up in the DMs, and even provided receipts for it. As much He asked if baddies were hitting him up in the DMs and was like, yo bro, can, can you share? Can I, can I have a crumb of baddie? Can I have a crumb, please? I can't get any baddie on my own, mister. Mister, can I have some of your baddie, please? Much as it sucks that this horror show will continue to go on indefinitely, since none of Shab's offenses are sufficient enough to have him go away, I have to say, there's so much unintentional humor that's just- Man is just a cockroach. Man just refuses to leave. <laughs> Man, man's, <laughs> man's just refusing to leave. He's like, he's like the guts of just taking punishment after punishment and not going away. Oozing from this whole phenomenon, it's actually impressive. Yeah, it's fun. Season one, we went to Asia forever, and then season two, we went to Europe, Africa, and, uh... Damn, you went to Africa? Well, just for one location. God damn it, what was I gonna say? We were in, uh... Morocco. Jesus Christ, dude. Uh, people say Africa like it's a country. I do it too, all the time. Africa is a country. Yeah. Ah! I cannot be this stupid, right? He just
just said he went to Morocco in Africa. What, what's Morocco? A city? The city of Morocco? Oh, Lord have mercy. I refuse to believe he could be this stupid. That's a big continent. That's continent, though, yeah. But moving on. Oh, man. The dude looks like a deer in headlights. Holy crap. Depending on how much of a Zoomer you are, it's quite likely you've never heard... Oh, good. We're done with Brendan Schaub. I could not stand any more of this BS. <laughs> yeah, I couldn't... Not. Thank you for moving on. ...of Dane Cook. But if you're a little older, and especially if you were going to college when he was at the peak of his fame, he was unavoidable. Born to a large family in the 70s, Dane described himself as someone who was introverted and shy. Why is everyone saying, oh no, Dane? I never heard of this guy. I never heard of this man. Been suffering from social anxiety at an early age. However, when he was at home, he had a passion for entertainment, putting me on his too. mother's wigs and dancing like to entertain me. his. I oh no! I take it back. He's not just like me. I've never put on my mother's wigs. This is never. <laughs> What? <laughs> Siblings. It took him a while for him to be comfortable enough to let that passion manifest, though, as he only began discovering his- I am so comfortable now that I'm wearing my mother's wigs. It's making me feel so strong and manly. Arr. An interest in doing comedy when he took theater in high school. Quickly, this developed into a professional pursuit. He started working as a performer in comedy clubs when he was just 18 years old. Throughout the 90s, he moved both to New York City and Los Angeles to try his hand at comedy. But it took until 1998 for him to briefly appear in the Comedy Central show Premium Blend, which eventually became the after. Who is this guy? I have never seen him before in my life. Mentioned live at Gotham. A few more years went by, during which Dane was relegated to being a successful. Is that his sexy pose? Is that a sexy pose? Oh man. Oh man. <laughs> what is that hairstyle? <laughs> like, yes, I want my hair to look like the fire festival. <laughs> I want you to make my hair look like the Alps. <laughs> oh no. Well, though, pretty small name that occasionally shows. That just looks like Ryan Reynolds, but halfway to becoming Deadpool. <laughs> <laughs> up in Comedy Central's roster. That is, until 2003, when he signed a contract with Comedy Central Records to release his first... I've never heard of this band. I don't understand. How have I never heard of him? Everyone in my chat's like, how have you never heard of him? I don't know. I never heard of him. Is he, like, famous or something? Comedy album, Harmful If Swallowed. While it wasn't insignificant by any means, given that the album eventually sold a total of a million and 400,000 copies That's in the United crazy. States, it didn't yet Damn. establish him as the extremely successful That's comedian successful. he would become. It was only two years <laughs> he said come. later when a second- Nux is a Zoomer, confirmed. I'm not a Zoomer! I promise! I'm a big boy, I'm not a Zoomer. I'm not a Zuma. An album Retaliation was released that Dane was really making the rounds. The album debuted at number four on the Billboard 200, a feat which hadn't been achieved since 1978 by Steve Martin's A Wild and Crazy Guy. The this is not the time where you're not supposed to trust me. Listen, I would never lie about this. Why are you not trusting me now? You're supposed to trust me. I'm supposed to build your trust and gain your ga gain all of your, your your convictions and your dreams so that when I launch CryptoZoo, you'll buy my shit! The record went gold within a week of its release, Damn. platinum in the same year, oh, and what? double platinum two years later. Hold on, why is he in this video if he's so successful, huh? Huh? You said not to trust you? Well, yeah, but I didn't mean crypto scams. Those, those I want you to believe. Those you're supposed to swallow, hook, line, and sinker. I want you to swallow my crystal crypto scans like your mom was swallowing my cock. <laughs> A comedy gold. It's weird to think that comedy albums used to go platinum, but I guess those were different times, as signified by this insanely 2000s infused cover art made by Dane himself, by the way. <laughs> I believe that. Oh, that that looks so bad. That looks so bad. Oh god, I Oh man. Oh man, brother. Look at this look at this this freaking cop this, this is just Gotta love that tattoo. So boss mode. It's safe to say this album made him a celebrity, as he instantly went on to perform at the most illustrious venues a comedian could get their hands on. From the MTV Awards to the TD Garden, where he recorded his first HBO special, titled Vicious Circle. Retaliation was also the beginning- It's a vicious circle! 
ball. Speaking of another trend in Dane's career, his tendency to maximize the sheer volume of material he performs, with the album's duration totaling almost two hours. Later on, he and Dave Chappelle would go on to compete for the Laugh Factory's Damn. endurance record, culminating in Dane performing for a whopping seven hours. I don't- Whoa, what? Okay, why is he in this video, though? I'm getting scared. Why is he in this video, though? I feel like by the fact that he's in this video, things do not end quite as hunky-dory as they seem. I don't know about you, but I doubt there's no one funny enough on planet Earth to merit you listening to their stand-up for seven hours straight. But Man stole shit, huh? Uh, that's where this is gonna go. But apparently, Dane succeeded. Dane instantly tried to branch off from stand-up and try his hand at conventional media. While his first attempt at it, a sitcom TV show called Cooked didn't get picked up. Just a year later, he starred as the lead role in the movie Employee of the Month, which solidified him as a competent actor. The film made more than double its budget, which isn't bad, especially for a comedy movie. Just especially a year later... Especially by today's standards, dude, Indiana Jones didn't do this shit. Later, Dane once again was a lead actor in what was probably the biggest film of his entire career, Good Luck Chuck. And though it grossed a total of $35 million in the US, and another 24 worldwide, the movie was relentlessly panned by critics who saw the movie as an extension of his comedy career, meaning they called him unfunny and tryhard. The disparity between his success and the perceived quality of his work just kept on growing. Interesting. Sounds like something is amiss. Sounds like something suspicious is going on. Cue the Among Us soundtrack. Among Us sounds, please. No matter what direction he went in. It's worth noting that his move... No matter what direction he went in? Bro, man, went... Damn into the film industry didn't negatively affect his career as a performing comic, since he was also regularly doing massive, month-long stand-up tours in colleges throughout America. Another impressive feat of his was selling out the Madison Square Garden, which had He was on the Logan Paul podcast, wasn't he? That's a little sus. Only been accomplished once before in 1990. Unsurprisingly, he was also netting all kinds of- What is that hair? Oh my god, dude, please stop. You already killed us. Awards and nominations for his work as a comic. However, it was becoming noticeable that his persona as a comic was highly reflective of who he was in general. In interviews he gave, he was Darth Maul all along. Often answered questions in a clever, even arrogant way, as if he was still in character, which many felt was forced. Yeah, People cringe. also found it obnoxious how often he and would blast uh, right. That's cringe. I I'm not gonna lie. Cringe. Yep. Cringe. Don't stay in character, bro! Through the allotted time of his shows, ignoring the repeated signals for him to come off the stage so that the other comics could perform. For okay, a bit of a narcissist, bit of a psycho, bit of an egotistical bitch. He just like me, for real. <laughs> so relatable. Perhaps most importantly, his astronomic rise to fame was met with utter confusion from many people who didn't find him funny, including some other comedians. One common observation in regards to how discrepant Dane Cook's success was compared to his onstage material was that his success was due to being well marketed, not necessarily because of his talent as a comedian. Oh yeah. Yo, I feel like Hollywood today really needs to take a page out of this guy's book. If that's the case, then, then there's a lot to learn. Did I mention my movie Employee of the Month? Well... Oh my god, this is the first time I'm hearing how he sounds, and I am impressed. It comes out on October 6th. Why Repeat he, after me. Why is he talking like that? Is that how he talks? Why do people like him? Is that how he's supposed to sound? Hey, this wasn't an ad. This was not an ad. Yeah, I would get sued my ass off if I did that after a sponsored segment in a video. Uh, I'm just saying. I'm just saying, why, why do influencers need more integrity than these people? That, that should not be real. October 6th, theaters everywhere. In 2002, Dane spent all of his savings, $25,000. What? There's no way this man is a popular comedian and he spent all of his savings of $25,000. Dude sounds like such a goober. Holy crap. Like, I don't even want to use this word because this word connotes things that I, I don't even want to connote. I don't want to be the guy that has a word like this in my repertoire, but I'm just going to say it. Man sounds like a total poser. Sounds like a complete poser, bro. Which is a lot of money, especially if you're- Is it though? For a guy with a platinum album? Man's radiating Discord mod energy. Someone with no steady source of income to make his website, danecook.com. It's kind of crazy to think he put that much money into making something as simple as a website. But again, back then, making a website wasn't as streamlined as it is nowadays. 
True, but also back then, spending $25,000 is a lot more than today. Hold, hold on. Wait a second. I'm, I'm sorry. He spent $25,000 on this shitty website? Man is such a poser. You didn't have Squarespace. 2002 is so early that it's not even Wild West internet. It's Spanish colonies internet. Another smart Damn. move from Dane was getting on social media, which at this point meant making an account on MySpace, where he accumulated over 1 million friends. Both of these early- Yo, he got a million friends on MySpace? That's the saddest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> Yo, a million friends on MySpace? That's like the equivalent of what? One friend in real life? <laughs> oh, man. This is just making me sad. I'm just feeling bad for this guy. Whoa, god damn. The adoptions of things that are the norm nowadays made the promotion of his shows exponentially more effective, and consequently it drove high demand for his act, and many could essentially get into any venue. When asked about his online marketing strategies, Dane said, I got my balls busted for a long time when I started the website. Those same comics that were busting on me were coming back to me five years later and asking, hey, how do I set up a MySpace? Looking back, I think Damn. a lot of the hate this guy got had to do with people being envious of how effective he was at selling his act. Maybe you so could argue that his actual comedy wasn't amazing, but what he was amazing at was getting it seen. It's been pointed out that Dane was more of a storyteller than a proper comedian who tells jokes, and that's kind of true. But more so, he figured out that if he just managed to be likable on stage to his target audience of frat bros and otherwise college-aged fans, he could get away with a lot of his more unconventional stuff. If I- I'm so confused. Why is this guy on this video? I feel like he doesn't deserve hate. Okay, so he's not that funny, but he's not like some sort of psychopath. Like, why is he even here? Unless, unless there's more. If I were a regular comedian back then, I'd also be seething at this guy who just prances around and makes funny faces and sounds, while not adhering to the typical standards of what a joke is in stand-up, while he made 10 times what all the other comedians made. The fact of the matter is that he was just ahead of his time. Dude, According he, to Dane himself, the, many of the- you see, It's the Sniper Wolf effect. There's no way. This man was Sniper Wolf before Sniper Wolf. Steals shit. Way too popular for doing mediocre garbage. Promoted by YouTube, despite not having the talent for it. He's just the sniper wolf. He's never done anything incredibly heinous. He's just kind of, kind of mid <laughs> everywhere else. Damn. He's the shadman of comedy. Oh, shit. There's no way it's that simple. There has to be more. Like, I, I feel like I... I expected more. The comedians who were criticizing him at the time eventually came around to admit they were speaking out of jealousy. But it's not just jealousy as much as it was resentment over Dane bucking the system and being rewarded for doing so. To put it in perspective, Dane peaked in the mid-2000s, when the format of comedy had already been set in stone by people like Richard Pryor, George Carlin, and Bill Hicks. This meant that if you were a comedian, you had to be edgy, offensive, irreverent, make jokes about religion, drugs, and the government, etc, etc. Uh... This is set into hyperdrive by how the internet was in the mid-2000s thousands, when this crowd tended to be involved in never-ending debates about creationism and other we-live-in-a-society type topics. Overall, okay, there was all right, all right. the pretense that comedy was synonymous with being a critical thinker and cultural commentator. Meanwhile, Dane was exclusively interested in making people laugh. Any kind okay, of people, by respect. any means necessary. Even okay, less respect. Even if it meant being lowbrow and resorting to relatability to sell a bit. It's fitting that he was the first performer to promote himself through social media, since his humor is very close to the kind of thing your average Facebook mom may think is funny today bro stole his comedy act from ifunny oh no men 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 stole his, his act from ifunny no ifunny wrote his act oh oh hey newsflash 20 years ago they were all dane cook fans and probably trying to sleep with him at his shows the contrast made okay i think he was before my time i'm not a zoomer but i've never it's just before my time I don't know how I never heard of this guy. Many people think that liking Dane Cook made you a casual and not a fan of real comedy. True. Because of how commercial- True. It's like if you're a Nux fan. It's not like, it doesn't mean you're a fan of VTubers. 
You're just a fan of me because I'm absolutely and positively hilarious. <laughs> it has nothing to do with my genre of content. Well, he was, he became cool to hate. Despite earning the ire of many comedians who saw his routine as bastardizing the medium, other comics remained steadfast in defending him. Even a few legendary ones, like Patrice O'Neill and Bill Burr. At the time he was peaking in popularity, both of his parents died, followed by his half-brother being sentenced. He's not a groomer. He's just a loser. Damn, I've never heard something so real. ...to six years in prison and 16 years of probation for embezzling $12 Holy million dollars from Dane. Despite this, Dane's Damn! comedy retained his tongue-in-cheek juvenile attitude with little to no content of depth, which both Holy surprised crap. and annoyed many people who expected him to, at some point, mature and become more personal with his comedy. But that wasn't the only reason people disliked him. Much like Amy Schumer... It was because he was cringe and not based. No! Anything but that! The dark side! He got in hot water for parts of his acts that were a bit too similar to that of other comedians. Oh shit. Oh shit! The sniper wolf effect! Which in the world of comedy is a cardinal sin that could easily get you blackballed and ostracized, oh, sure. which Dane definitely was in a lot of ways. Most prominently, Joe Rogan and Louis C.K. both mentioned noticing bits that they had worked on and performed in Dane Cook's presence at comedy clubs, reappearing in his act later on. Luckily for Dane, not only did this not affect his career while it was taking off, but as it was slowing down in the late 2000s and early 2010s, Ooh, that face doesn't scream anything positive. Both Joe and Louis forgave him and reconnected, with Joe having him on his podcast and Louis having him do a cameo on his show, where they actually talked over the Joe theft accusations. 2006. That should have been like my triumph. And I enjoyed it, Louis, for maybe two months. Two months before it started to suck. Dude, why is his voice like that? <laughs> I've enjoyed it for two months. Two months! And then I slept with Sneeko's girlfriend because everything I read about me was about how I stole jokes from you, which I didn't. I kind of think you did. Dude! Ah! I have never, ever seen an L that big. I've seen some big L's, but I have never seen one quite that big or in my face. That L was bigger than the dick of the guy sleeping with Sneeko's girlfriend right now. Why would I steal three jokes from you when I have hours of material? Why? Why would I do that? Risk my rip- Oh shit, he, that's not a good defense, homie. I don't think that you saw me do those jokes and said, I'm gonna tell those jokes too. I don't think there's a world where you're that stupid. Ever since 2010, All when right. he released a- All right, the he can't be that stupid defense. I, 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 I respect that. Greatest hits compilation called I Did My Best, he's gradually distanced himself from the spotlight on purpose since he heavily associated being famous with being disliked. Unfortunately, around the same time he was finding some peace for the joke theft, he once again drew negative attention from other comedians after a conversation of his with fellow comic Stephen Byrne. While the two agree on some parts of this conversation, such as Dane claiming Steve was stealing his essence, which was pretty rich for a guy fresh off of being accused of being a joke thief, Let Dane and out. Steve remember the conversation Let very out. differently. While Dane focuses on Steve acknowledging his struggles to find himself, Steve emphasizes Dane's bizarre behavior. So I moved to LA in, in 2004. Dane is blowing the fuck up, right? The word gets out, oh, oh, this new guy from New York, he's pretty fun, he's cool. It's all going right, great, right, right. and then I'm not getting booked on that show anymore. Oh. And this guy, Jay Davis, booked it. And I called Jay, I'm like, what's going on? Is something wrong or whatever? He's like, yeah, yeah, uh, Dane's got an issue with you. He doesn't oh, no. want you on the shows anymore. Yeah, but essentially what happened is I went over and I said, what's your issue? And he, he said, he said, I feel like you're stealing my essence. And I was like, what? what? And he's like, you're you're taking my essence with you on stage. And I'm like, Dane, I work so hard. I'm not trying to be. What, what the frick does that mean? What does stealing my essence mean? Stole my essence, bro, this man. He just, he took all the cum out of my penis. Th this man took the cum out of my balls and he just ran with it. I don't even know what to do anymore with, with the amount of cum he stole from my ball sack. Uh, a a shittier version of you. While he distanced himself from comedy in 2011, he came back in 2012 and immediately caught the public's attention once again. But th Dude, that smile is freaking terrifying. Holy crap. Man is, man is two steps away from becoming the Joker. Dude, editor, can you put Joker paint on this man's face, please? Thank you.
this time in a much more negative way. Upon entering the Laugh Factory and bumping multiple other comedians, meaning he was going to do his set before theirs despite not having planned for it, he performed for a total of 45 minutes, which, if the people who were in the audience's testimonies or anything to go by, consisted mostly of bombing horribly. Ooh. Fellow comedian TJ Miller Ooh. said, Dane Cook is eating shit at the Laugh Factory. Ooh. He bumped Bobby Lee and is being just mean. The hubris of this man unfortunately led to his fall, but I'm afraid he's a damaged man. That's it, baby. Him and Light Yagami, they're the same, except Light is intelligent and hubris made him fall, and and this guy kind of kind of seems like a, a complete loser. <laughs> Yeah, it's just rough like that. I remember hearing about someone named Dane Cook in college on Napster. I heard harmful if swallowed after college. Then there was a backlash. There always is. It's inevitable. But it grew. It was more than I could believe. And it was due in part to him. I liked him. His there was so much semen thieving. It just it was rough out there, buddy. You don't understand. You go in there a man, you come out with no essence in your balls snake bit, a lot of sort of absurdist stuff. Suddenly he was on SNL, he was the king of MySpace, and he was famous. He was the king of MySpace. Man was the PewDiePie of MySpace. Damn, bro. This guy over here, he was the Elon Musk of threads.com. Good luck Chuck and Vicious Circle sealed his fate in contemporary culture. And then last night, he got on stage and was vicious, misogynistic, cruel, and arrogant. He talked about not paying for an abortion. He talked about what? finding some whore to, to take out his anger at his ex-girlfriend. Huh? He talked about how girls would That's do anything cool. for him because I'm me. He got mad when people were texting. Dane Cook is on stage. He said, have some f***ing respect. Here's an idea, Dane. There's no way this man really was on stage in a show, saw someone in the audience texting and called him out. There is no way this is even real. Like, no one can have an ego that big, right? Right? Dane, have some respect for the audience that gave you the chance to be what you dreamed of being, and don't be mad at them because you screwed it all up from hubris and thirst for fame. Don't disrespect the people that gave you a chance. Don't do an hour of mean-spirited trash. And Dane Cook, certainly don't ask anyone to feel sorry for you. If you are the person you were on stage last night, then you are not a good person. You need Whoa. all the luck in the world to realize you need to go to Man, therapy and into. figure out how to not be a hateful person. Stop performing until you do so. A few years Love later, it. he was banned from the Laugh Factory, though the reasons why are unclear. Well, that's report. Oh God, man, has that Nikocado avocado smile. Editor, can you put a side by side of this face next to the the Nikocado grin? Thank you. Reported that he harassed a waiter and said that he owned the Laugh Factory. Other comics claimed that his habit of bumping acts and overstaying his allotted time on stage eventually caught up to him. On a night that he was told specifically not to perform at all, he convinced the management to no let him stay shot. up by promising to do a short set, only to break said promise and be there for much longer than he was supposed to. In another instance of Dane using is. the credit he had with club owners to encroach upon other comedians, he made the mistake of doing so with the aforementioned Dave Chappelle. Chappelle supposedly, Whoa. the story goes, came into the Laugh Factory one night. Jamie said, hey, it's it's Dane's night. And Chappelle, this is the height of Chappelle's show and everything. He's like, what the, what does that mean? He's like, it's just Dane's night. He's like, just do a tight 10. And he's like, okay. Now, uh -oh. any other comedian uh -oh. would go do 45 uh -oh. minutes. That's just what most people do. But Chappelle, if this is true, is and we already know he's a different animal anyway, he goes up and does a tight 10. Okay. But right at the end goes, you know what? I don't usually do this, but I'm going to go outside and smoke some cigarettes. If y'all want to come out, hang out, take pictures, whatever, I'll be out there. And oh the my whole God. crowd fucking walked away. And he's like, there's Dane's night. Well, Dane. Oh my God. Man used his unfathomable levels of Riz. His infinite riz to just completely cuck the ever-living shit out of this man. Dude, oh my god, Sneeko is getting third-degree cuck burns right now just thinking about this. What a savage! Oh my lord, I have never heard of that. Dude, no honor among thieves, holy shit. That's crazy. In claims this story is false, I'll let you be the judge. Also in 2012, if you can believe it, he found himself in boiling hot water once again. I believe it. I, I, I didn't hear it yet, but I believe it. Making a joke about- Dude, stop bringing up Sneeko. It's really hard to stop bringing up Sneeko when he is my upstairs neighbor and there are so many women just- And so many men are just banging his girlfriend right now. I, I can literally cannot sleep. I can't eat without hearing Sneeko's girlfriend screaming upstairs. It is so annoying. Just so many guys. So, so many, bro. It's not easy being Sneeko. Like, I'm just gonna say that. 
the Aurora shooting, where he said that The Dark Knight Rises, the movie the audience was watching in the theater, that something's rising upstairs, and it's not Sneeko's dick. <laughs> I was going to say it's not the Dark Knight, but I got shot up. Sucked so much that the watchers were probably wishing they were dead. This came as an extreme shock oh. to the audiences who knew him as a guy whose comedy was generally pretty safe, especially considering the joke was told just one week after the massacre. As Jesus, that's... Dude, dude, dude. When you start falling off as a wholesome comedian... When you start falling off as a wholesome comedian and you have to go the, the actual dark side route... And you're like, well, I'm going to start being edgy now. I'm going to start, oh, God, that's that's the beginning of the end. As soon as the backlash began, he immediately took to Twitter to apologize. I'm devastated by the recent tragedy in Colorado and did not mean to make sure light of what really. happened. I made a bad judgment call with my material last night yeah. and regret making a joke at such a sensitive time. See, but here's the thing. A lot of comedians are, like, kind of off, off the cuff. They're on a stream equivalent, you know? They're just... But he has a written bit. Dude wrote his bit beforehand. There is no world. Sorry, man. Sorry, bro. I'm sorry, bro. I don't believe that is an apology because you think you did something wrong. That is an apology because you got backlash. There is no world that this is an apology because he actually regrets doing something. Sorry. Just have to say it. It's like Logan Paul's apology for his Suicide Forest video. Dude apologized for that video because he got an unfathomable level of hate. There was zero apology because of the actual video. I know the second that man posted his apology video, he's like, I cannot believe the internet's upset at me. I hope they buy this horse shit. My heart goes out to all the families and friends of the victims. Sure. Well, none of this helped at all with his work towards slowly salvaging his reputation as a genuine comic, Dan continued touring as a comedian with some success, as well as making the odd movie cameo. Nowadays, despite how massive he used to be, he's mostly a forgotten artifact of the 2000s, and the last time he's gotten negative attention was when he began dating a woman named Kelsey Taylor, who was 26 years his junior, but since she was- He dated a girl 26 years younger than himself. Jesus. 20 years old, it never evolved into a larger controversy. When we speak about people who got in trouble for stealing material, there's always one name that outshines every other. Oh God, there's another comedian. I thought we were ending on this. There's a whole other dude in this video. Oh boy. Carlos Mencia. Born Ned Arnell Mencia, he grew up with a total of 17 siblings due to a domestic dispute. Dude, I like comedians. I've heard of comedians. Never heard of any of these guys. <laughs> What? Between his parents, he moved to the U.S. to live with his uncle. Unfortunately, the consequence of this was that he spent his formative years in East Los Angeles, where he saw all kinds- That's rough, buddy. Imagine spending your formative years in Los Angeles. I cannot imagine a worse fate. ...kinds of criminality. Despite successfully staying out of trouble for most of his youth, he admits to having sold drugs and robbed a house when he was 19. Thankfully, that was a fluke, and Mencia went on to enroll in California State University to study electrical engineering while he worked at Farmers Insurance. At his job, he would often rant to his co-workers about the things that annoyed him, which they found funny enough to tell him that he should try to do stand-up comedy during an amateur night at the Laugh Factory. <laughs> this was a shock to him. It's an ego trip on the way. Ego's ego afoot. There is ego afoot. Since he didn't even know being a comedian was an option. But as soon as he just Don't call me a Zoomer. Don't do it. I'm not a Zoomer, I swear. Discovered it was a possible career path. I just live under a rock sometimes, okay? He decided to drop out of college and quit his job to pursue it. Un Man is treading the ground that so many YouTubers have tread after. Surprisingly, his entire family thought he was out of his mind for neglecting potentially becoming an electrical engineer, a conventional and stable- <laughs> Just like me, for real. <laughs> Lol. Limo. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry. I- Yeah. Well, ...profession by every standard to try and be a comedian. His father, however- Yeah, when I explained to my parents that guy- Guys, I am not going to med school. I'm pursuing a career as a YouTuber. That was a very surprising day for all of them, that's for sure. They were like, hmm. I, I completely support you. So, yeah, they were not. <laughs> they, they didn't, uh, I wouldn't say that they, uh, they exactly were like, yeah, that. I, I completely support all of that. 
<laughs> I have crippling depression. <laughs> uh... Showed some support, even if ironically, by saying, if he wants to be a clown, let him juggle. Initially, he was still performing as Ned, but in 1988, the owner of the comedy store, Mitzi Shore, decided to introduce him as Carlos Mencia to highlight his Hispanic heritage, a decision which Carlos himself thought was smart and ran with. This name change marked the beginning of his rise as a comedian, as Carlos saw great success throughout most of the 90s. Besides performing at the biggest comedy venues, he appeared in illustrious TV shows such as Arsenio Hall and was hired by HBO to host the Loco Slam, a Latino comedy showcase. While Loco Slam Pretty didn't cool. do very well, well, its quality didn't get pinned on Mencia, who went on to do the HBO comedy Half Hour, the Latino Laugh Festival, and Funny is Funny. All Dude, these are all rated threes. Why is he saying it like these are success stories? These are these are colossal failures. Holy crap. If I got 30% likes to dislikes on a YouTube video, I would I would kill myself. <laughs> okay, that was a joke, that was a joke! All with differing degrees of positive response from audiences. While he had already secured his position as a professional comic, he hadn't managed to successfully break into working on TV shows. Early in the 2000s, his success in stand-up touring landed him a couple of half-hour specials on HBO, one of them even getting an award for best stand- Damn, HBO was churning out shit back in the day too, that's crazy. ...and-up comedy special, which piqued the interest of more legacy media outlets. George Lopez hit him for stealing his bit? Damn. Finally, in 02, he performed on Comedy Central Presents, which presumably kickstarted a negotiation for a potential TV show on the network. Three years later, the show materialized as Mind of Mencia, made in the format of Chappelle's show, which was in the middle of its run as one of the most successful sketch shows of all time. And Bro, whenever I just see that rating 3, I'm like, this is one of the most successful sketch shows of all time, rated 3.1 out of 10. I'm just like... Uh, okay. In a lot of ways, Mencia was the person picked to potentially fill in for Dave Chappelle, surely a heavy weight on his shoulders. While Mind of Mencia had good ratings during its first season, its second season was Comedy Central's highest rated show, behind only South Park. However, it what? slowly dwindled in popularity over the next couple of seasons until it was ultimately canceled. At the South Park taught me how to truly be funny. I actually figured it out. I, I, I have learned how to, dis to, to be funny thanks to South Park, and thanks to all the comedians we've seen here. Hey, <laughs> poop, butthole, butthole, poop, bah, ha, vagina, vagina, poop, ba, poop, butthole, ha, ha, vagina. Dude, Amy Schumer has taught me so much. At the peak of Mind of Mencia's popularity, people began speaking out their problems with Carlos, perhaps because it annoyed them how big he was getting, despite how widely disliked he was as a comic. But why was he disliked? Well, besides the fact that many people already considered him to be unfunny and annoying due to how much he relied on racial jokes as a crutch for pretty much all of his material, what eventually overshadowed Mencia's entire career was the- Racial jokes as a crutch? Dude, racial jokes are supposed to be peak. You're supposed to be funny enough to pull off a solid racial joke. If racial jokes are pulling you along, dog, that is just sad. <laughs> I've never made racial jokes, so I wouldn't know. <laughs> don't, Twitter, don't cancel me. Listen, I'm a good guy, I promise. The endless list of jokes he stole from other, more established comedians. In 2005, one of the first people to ever publicly bring this up was Joe Rogan, Ooh. in a post to his blog labeled, Carlos Mencia is a weak-minded joke. Man, it's so crazy to think about how Joe Rogan's really been on the scene for so long. Like, it's wild to think about how long Joe Rogan's been around. Thief. The post reads, The latest and most disgusting joke thief of all is a guy named Carlos Mencia. The really crazy thing is that that's not even his real name. He sells himself as being Mexican, but the reality is that his name is Ned Holness, and he's actually- Dude, if my name was Holness, I would change my name too. It's like, bro, Holness? Dude, if my name was Holness, I would change it to Mencia in an instant. And once you change your name, do it to the most advantageous name, bro. My name was the Holness? Damn. Bro, you see, that's what I would call Sneeko's girlfriend. <laughs> Actually, half German and half Honduran. The Mexican hook is something he did to ingratiate himself with the local Mexican population of LA where he started. Now, normally, I wouldn't dedicate so much time to talk about a piece of shit like Ned on my website, but this stupid motherfucker <laughs> talks shit about me on the radio, so it's Damn. open season for hacks. I got a funny email. It's so funny how comedians are just like the OG YouTubers. Bro, the OG YouTubers like shitting on each other and stuff? Like that. That is so funny. I like, I can't get over it. These guys have been, YouTubers are doing just what comedians used to do. And now comedians consider YouTubers lesser beings because of all their drama. 
Bro. Comedians are just the first YouTubers. Email today from one of the guys on the Frank Show in Tucson saying that Carlos, aka Ned Holness, or however the <laughs> Holness you spell it, his real name, also known as the phony Mexican, or Carlos Menstelia, what other comics call him. Menstelia! Ah! Damn, these are comedians. These are comedians, guys. This is this is comedy gold. Was talking shit about me on the radio. He sent me an audio file, and since I'm bored in a fucking hotel room in DC, I listened to it. He talks about how you guys were saying he sounds a lot like me, and how I said the force was weak with him, which I did, and that was being nice. What I should have said that is was that- was being nice when I said the force was weak with him. <laughs> I actually meant Menstelia! Sorry, I can't get over how bad that joke is. I, I, I can't. He's a weak-minded, delusional joke thief. True. What's really hysterical is that he talks about a fictional occurrence at the comedy store where I nervously washed him in the back room and where me and a bunch of comics supposedly what? sat around and talked about him for an hour. And oh, then finally, in this fantasy scenario, I admitted that he's really good. I'm going to be... That is the greatest thing I've ever heard. Man had to make up this whole shit. There's all ass shit about he saw me in the back room of the store and when he thought no one was listening he secretly admitted I'm actually funny and 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 it's true and he would never admit it out loud but secretly just to me he would sit that's the saddest shit I've ever heard in my life. I've heard some sad shit but that's up there. Damn. Be real clear, stupid. That never happened. The only time any comic, including me, watches you is to see if you're stealing material, which Damn. you do all the time. See, Damn. that's why people. Dude, dude, it's unbelievable. I feel like drama YouTubers literally write better than this. Like, that's crazy. Say you steal, because it's a fact. No one is running around saying Chris Rock is a thief, or Dave Chappelle is a thief, or even me for that matter. But hundreds of comics recognize you as a thief. Coincidence? What, all... I think not! Damn. Destroyed. All jealous? They're jealous of you and not Chris Rock? I've seen you steal over and over again. I've seen you steal from Paul Mooney. I've seen you steal from Dave Chappelle. I've seen you steal from old Richard Pryor albums. I've seen you steal from Jeff Foxworthy. Carlos was claiming that I was watching him on stage, pacing the back of the room, and then reluctantly admitting his greatness to other comics. Dude needs to watch a good moist critical video and figure out how to roast him. It's like, man steals it. <laughs> I thought of something so nasty, I can't say it. Uh, this man steals so many jokes, he, he steals more jokes than, than other men stole Sneeko's girlfriend's virginities. Damn. Can't believe man, a man would do this. Bro thinks he's so hot shit. Man steals so many jokes. <laughs> it's like a septic tank stealing all the shit out of the, the septic sewer sponge where... <laughs> I don't know why every time I think of Charlie in Lions, I think of <laughs> I think of septic tanks. God damn it. What's funny about that is that my trusty cameraman actually filmed Carlos watching me on stage from He filmed filmed Carlos watching me on stage right before he filmed other men sleeping with Sneeko's girlfriend. <laughs> various parts of the room, and then filmed him sucking on stage after me, talking about how terrible he was. If you really love comedy, stop supporting joke thieves. Here's some more audio, this time of George Lopez from the Stern Show yesterday talking about what a Bro, thief man, Carlos is. Stop. Joe Rogan then linked to a clip of George Lopez on Howard Stern, speaking about how Mencia took 13 minutes worth of his material oh, and God. used it in his HBO special. At the time this post was published, it remained an internal matter between comedians, but two years later, the static between Joe Rogan and Mencia materialized in a YouTube video that became extremely popular. Originally, the video was put together and uploaded by Joe Rogan himself as an episode oh, of a damn. series called Joe's Show, which must have been lost in the deep crevices of the old internet. Regardless of that, it consisted of footage of Joe Rogan confronting Carlos Mencia on stage about the jokes he stole, interspersed with a compilation of clips to prove Joe's points. During the confrontation, Carlos is visibly caught lying multiple times, including at one point when he admits that George Lopez beat him up, but claims it was because what? George was jealous of him and not because of joke theft. Joe was backed up by... Bro, not every comedian in the world is jealous of you, homie. At some point, that, that excuse has to run dry. 
audience and multiple other notable comics who either recognized that Carlos stole from their peers or were stolen from themselves. This devastating takedown hurt Mencia's reputation in a way that has never been mended since. At the time, Joe Rogan was in a much less established position than Carlos was, and because of that, the comedy store took Carlos' side since he brought a lot more people into the club whenever he performed. This resulted in Joe being banned from the comedy store oh! and being dropped by his agency, Gersh, when he refused to apologize. Man got dropped by Gersh! That's crazy. Oh, you know he has a thorn. You know every time he sees some someone shitting on Mencia right now, he is toasting, brother. Apologize to Carlos for their public spat. I can only imagine how much they rue the day they dropped Joe, since nowadays he's one of, if not the biggest names to ever come out of the comedy scene. Literally. While Carlos has gradually faded further into obscurity, with a permanently got that tarn million dollar contract. That's crazy name. And I say permanently, not because people were unwilling to forgive him, but because he was never willing to take responsibility for stealing jokes. In the years that immediately followed, he tried either ignoring the accusations or openly joking about them as if they obviously held no weight, which resulted in people disliking him even more. It didn't help that in 2009, Mencia got dropped from a celebrity lineup in Mardi Gras for joking about Hurricane Katrina, saying that it proved black people couldn't swim, which... Yeah, I, I, I get why, why someone would get hate for that. I, I, I can see it only further damaged his career as a mainstream comedian. One of the first opportunities he had to redeem himself as a reputable comic was given by Mark Marin, who invited him onto his WTF podcast. Mark was one of the first comedians to take the podcast route besides Joe Rogan himself, and definitely held some sway in the community. But It's so crazy, the rise of podcasts in modern, in recent years. The way cod podcasts had like this meteoric rise is like kind of crazy. Carlos squandered it by continuing to dance around admitting any particular instance where he told a joke that wasn't his. This was just the first manifestation of a pattern that Carlos has continued to act out to this day. Just two years ago in 2021, a whole decade and a half after the drama began, he was once again given a chance to recognize and apologize for the jokes he stole by none other than Bobby Lee, one of the people he stole from who invited him on his podcast. In the roughly half an hour clip on YouTube where Bobby talks about the incident at the comedy store with Carlos, he still acts like he doesn't know what anyone's talking about when they accuse him of being a joke thief. To make matters worse, Carlos starts talking about how the only reason people think he's you, a joke- You gotta just sit this man down and show his jokes compared to the other jokes. I would pay to see that. Joke thief is that Joe was popular online and he wasn't, oh, so he could never break. combat that narrative. To anyone with even a cursory knowledge of what happened, it's almost shocking to see how detached from reality Carlos is. Since when the original confrontation happened, he was the one with a massive platform while Joe was still trying to transition away from doing Fear Factor. It's honestly pretty depressing to see a guy cling to delusions for this long, especially Bruh. when he has nothing to gain from it. Much like Bobby Lee, many of the people Carlos was beefing with back then have no interest in holding a grudge against him, including Joe, who has even gone as far to say he regrets how he went about calling Carlos out. Other joke thieves have also been forgiven once That's they show crazy. some modicum of regret, That's but Carlos crazy. prefers to continually act as if he's done nothing wrong. It's like he feels like the moment he, he admits to stealing all the jokes, his entire prestige falls apart. His entire air that he's built for himself just completely collapses and he's just not willing. That's crazy. And that he's totally open to apologizing for stealing jokes if someone were to prove that he actually did it. Oh, what a bitch. Which of course he pretends hasn't happened. Oh my god! If someone proved that I stole jokes, I would totally believe it. And then they like show it to him and he like closes his eyes. I can't see you! And then they start explaining to him, la 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 I can't I can't hear anything you're saying. La 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 I didn't steal any jokes. La 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 You see you can't prove it. Bye. Damn. Damn. Because of how scathing all this was to him, from 2011 onwards, Carlos remained effectively detached from the world of comedy altogether, and <laughs> nah. is still in denial about what happened, even to this very day. Just hearing the name Kathy Griffin is- Oh god, there's another one! I thought we were free! All it takes to remember why this comic is so notorious. Who's you probably can immediately recall the exact incident in question. Rather, the image that gained her so much backlash. On May 30th, 2017, she I, released I a photo no for a whole this is, sorry. holding up a Trump mask with fake blood all over it, essentially depicting him being beheaded, which was negatively oh. received by most people. Oh, you mean making believe that someone you don't like is beheaded would be perceived negatively by some people? Dude, comedy is so dead, am I right?
regardless of political affiliation for how over the top it was. But how did she get there? Before that point, she had a fairly successful run as a comedian, from stand-up to sitcoms and reality shows. Her shtick was the typical offensive and vulgar fare of the popular female comedians at the time, with a particular focus on celebrity gossip. She was basically kryptonite for white women over 30. Between the years... I am the kryptonite for white women. Yo, she just like me, for real. I'm also like kryptonite for white women. They just can't stand to be around me. <laughs> that was a joke. I'm incredibly loving and lovable. And, and lots of people like me. And I have a lot of friends. <laughs> and they, they're not imaginary either. <laughs> Give me so much. <laughs> years of 2009 and 2014, she was nominated every year for a Grammy for Best Comedy Album, finally winning it in 2014. She had her own reality show in the 2000s that won two Emmys, and holds the record for having the most comedy specials. However, she always- That is not a compliment. It's like saying, dude, this YouTuber is so good, he uploaded the most videos of any YouTubers. Damn. She's had a knack for getting into drama. She's been banned from shows like The View and The Tonight Show with Jay Leno for making offensive jokes or talking Love. smack about celebrities. Love. In 2009, she would appear alongside Anderson Cooper for the CNN New Year's Eve broadcast and drop some profanity, getting her fired and forcing her to give her paycheck back Love. for the event. But she Dude, she is just eating shit. Holy crap. She would continue being a regular for CNN's New Year's celebrations for nearly the next 10 years, leading to other controversial instances, including one time when she got partially nude, and another where she pretended to blow Anderson Cooper. She's Maybe comedy's not the right place for you. Listen, maybe comedy's just the wrong spot. She's always been a staunch progressive. For example, supporting same-sex marriage back when it was a hotly contested issue. And so, come 2016, when Trump appeared on the scene and was surprisingly- <laughs> Trump- Okay, listen. Trump was the kryptonite for bad comedians. I feel like every bad comedian, they're, all their careers died the moment Trump showed up. Trump shows up, and all of the comedians collectively die. They're like, whoa, we're gonna make him the core of everything that we stand upon. He will become everything we talk about for the next 10 years. Elected, she was naturally part of the crowd of his most avid and enraged critics, which is why in 2017, she decided to partner up with photographer Tyler Shields and drop an image of her holding Trump's bloody head out of- Oh yeah, I remember this! Okay, now I know who we're talking about. Trump is a better comedian than them? Honestly, true. Trump's freaking hilarious. Say what you want. That man is funny as fuck. Holy shit. But, dog- I remember that. She she held up a fake version of Trump's decapitated head, which obviously is not that funny. Nowhere. Now, it was clearly an attempt to drum up controversy and gain more popularity off the drama that would naturally result. But Griffin got a bit more negative attention than she bargained for. On Twitter, there was backlash- Wait, you're saying she got hate for making believe she was killing a guy she didn't like? Damn. Women really are stepped upon by society. God, if only society would appreciate women more. Not only from conservatives, but even most liberals thought she went too far, yeah, saying yeah. she was inciting violence and it definitely crossed some kind of line. Uh, but yeah. there were career and even legal consequences for Kathy as well. Commenting on the resulting fallout, a BuzzFeed article from The Time reads, she talks about being banned from The View, allegedly repeatedly, not being asked back onto Ellen or Jay Leno's Tonight Show, or being confronted by Whitney Houston after cracking jokes about her in her stand-up. But the response to this particular gag has been far more costly. She lost her lucrative CNN New Year's Eve gig, a Ooh. televised event she's hosted since 2007 with Anderson Cooper, who also disavowed the photo and apparently hasn't spoken to her since. Yeah, On Tuesday, two sense. days after the image was posted, she released an apology video, a deeply awkward, barely 30 second clip, so stilted it seems like she has never had to apologize for anything before. Hey everybody, it's me, Kathy Griffin. Wow, she's lightning speed apology. Holy crap. I sincerely apologize. I'm sure you do because you said it was sincere, so I believe you. I am just now seeing the reaction of the- Oh, so you don't apologize for doing anything wrong. You apologize for the reaction. Got it, got it. These images, I'm a comic. I crossed the line. I moved the line, then I cross it. I went way too far. This is terrible. Oh my God. I feel like comed- so, To all the comedians out there that make fun of YouTubers or that look down on YouTubers, Dog, YouTubers are way out of your league. Holy crap, bro. I, I know this can't count as a YouTuber apology because she's not a YouTuber, but if this was a... This is the equivalent of whipping out a ukulele. Holy... 
Holy crap! I'm so sorry. I crossed the line and I moved the line and I, after moving it, I crossed it. So I'm sorry and I just now saw the reaction. The image is too disturbing. I understand how it offends people. Yeah. It wasn't oh, funny. She oh, she understands when she says that she she killed a guy and is holding her decapitated head. That she she understands how it it offends people. Oh, okay. I get it. I've made a lot of mistakes in my career. Yeah. I will continue. Right. I ask your. She will continue. All right, let's go. We got the sincere, I will continue making mistakes in my career. Forgiveness, taking down the image, gonna ask the photographer to take down the image, and I beg for your forgiveness. I went too far, I made a mistake, and I was wrong. And then, holy shit, she speed ran that crap. Today, she had a- I'm so sorry, I couldn't possibly be more sorry, I made so many mistakes in my career, and I'm probably gonna make way more, but whatever. Fuck that, I asked the photographer to take down the image. It's so sad and mean, and I, don't, I hate being that person. <laughs> Press conference with her attorney, Lisa Bloom, apologizing again, but also claiming that she's under Secret Service investigation. That sure you are. She's getting death threats. No, you're, okay, you might be getting death threats by, like, anonymous Twitter people, but, like, you're not under Secret Service investigation. Okay? And has been dropped for multiple jobs. See that, I believe for being cringe. Imagine being fired because of cringe. Five and counting. Bloom called the image a parody of Trump's own sexist remarks taken to an extreme, absurdist visual. And Griffin talked mostly about wanting to be a role model for other women as well as defending the First Amendment. What's happening to me has never happened. E what? Oh God, that's wild. Sure. Hello, Nux, you react to the dark side of reaction content? I think you are also a problem. Thank you for thinking I am a problem, but did you know that I actually asked Turkey Tom if I could react to his videos and he said yes? <gasps> Wait a second, are you are you are you assuming that I'm a problem for doing something wrong when when you didn't actually ask if I was? No. No. No you you didn't. Oh, that's rough. Ever in the history of this great country, which is that a sitting president of the United States and his grown children and the first lady are personally, I feel, trying to ruin my life forever, she said. Damn. Kathy's attorney, Lisa Bloom, also clarified. Wait, so she makes like one of the most vividly accurate portrayals of like a death threat. And she gets hate for it. And she says she's the first person to ever be in a position where she's being treated so unfairly. Can you please huff a little more copium? That would be really nice. Verified that, like many edgy works of artistic expression, the photo could be interpreted different ways, but Griffin never imagined that it could be interpreted as a threat of violence against Trump. That was never what she intended. She has never threatened or committed no. an act of violence against- The holding up the bloody head of Trump? It's because she's such a big fan. Guys, I don't know why you didn't notice it yourself. <laughs> also, my reactions are incredibly transformative. We have been watching this video for the last three hours. Uh, I have been uh, adding so much commentary. Like, uh, it's it's wild when... Because I get people showing up, oh my god, you're also a React content guy on your streams and on your second channel. And, I mean, sort of, yeah, but I definitely add a hell of a lot to what I'm watching against anyone. And I mean, yeah, if Griffin was truly intent on harming Trump, then she wouldn't have done a self-report to the whole world about it. But the people who had a problem with this image probably weren't offended just because they thought she was literally planning on murdering Trump. No, Trump no one thought she was planning on murdering Trump. It was just cringe. Mega cringe. Self would obviously respond on Twitter, stating, Kathy Griffin should be ashamed of herself, my children. Oh, Tom, you should have gotten someone better to do that Trump impersonation. Oh, man. Especially my 11-year-old son, Baron, are having a hard time with this. Sick. And safe to say, Griffin's apology was too little too late. People weren't keen on letting the incident go. Kathy would soon rescind her apology and now stands by the image and- flip-flopping loser that's what you are homie there's oh my god that's just pathetic and her career ever since has revolved around talking about this incident and all the backlash from it while she was temporarily suspended from her gigs in 2018 she had no trouble getting on talk shows of seth myers and bill maher to discuss the trump controversy she also launched a worldwide comedy tour called laugh your head off in reference to the photo
Oh, that's that's so funny. Oh, I, I oh, you head off, get it? Cause, cause Trump. Oh, I see what you did there. And shows sold out in multiple locations. Griffin did a special in 2019 called a. I guess people hate Trump more than people realize how dog shit she is. Damn, that's that's wild of a story, discussing her anecdotes of being interrogated by the DOJ and winding up on the no-fly list. Either people were quick to get over this incident, or there was a cohort of fans who actively endorsed her actions towards Trump. Over the past few years, she's continued to be a guest on many podcasts and shows, and continues to do stand-up. Other than all the drama, she's recently had personal struggles with her health in the form of lung cancer and PTSD. Damn. She also recently got in a spat with- See, like, obviously no one deserves the- no one deserves that shit, obviously. Uh, but, like, that doesn't mean that you should be forgiven either. Elon Musk on Twitter. Whatever her next endeavor is, the dedicated legion of wine moms that composes her fan base will surely be there for it. Yes. I, however, won't be. Not Aww. because of the Trump image, but because, um, I want to- He's not funny. Damn. You know, you can be forgiven for anything if you're just actually good at what you're doing. Like... <laughs> It's like something that no one no one really realizes. If a YouTuber is actually just making great content, it literally doesn't matter if they get canceled. If they just still make great content, they'll still get all the love and respect of their audience. If you were actually funny, no one would care that you did this. I leave and not record this video anymore. That was a great video, Mr. Tom. Uh, I respect it tremendously. Uh, Goddamn. Like, subscribe, and follow me on Twitch. Stay weird, fam.